here. It's January 18th. Uh, Director Garrett, I would, before the director's report, I have a quick comment that I'd like to share. First of all, Happy New Year. Grateful for everyone to be here today. Um, ODOT touches communities in a variety of ways, and I wanted to share today a um, kind of a creative solution to a problem, but also a way in which um, the agency itself is working outside the usual just transportation arena to solve community problems. So this is a note from Annette Leba, and she is the Regional Solutions Coordinator for the Governor's Office. And this uh, has to do with Mr. Bryant, who I think uh, in his team, so Region 4. Uh, her comment is that ODOT surplus property sale to Central Oregon Veterans Outreach was completed. Uh, the project is in partnership with the City of Bend. ODOT sold the property for basically what they paid for it about three years back, which, with increased housing prices in the community, is a bargain. The City of Bend provided the funding to the Central Oregon Vet Veterans Outreach for the majority of the purchase, which was about $270,000. ODOT's carrying the paper on another remaining amount, which is small, to be able to make this actually work. Uh, COVO, the Veterans Outreach, is putting in a formerly homeless veteran family with a minimal rent, which is about a quarter of the market. And if you've been uh, uh, following housing prices and the crisis that we have in the state of Oregon, um, it is paramount in our community uh, and our veterans are struggling uh, at, a, at a gr even greater pace there. Uh, so that is also to help with taxes and expenses. This is the second property that ODOT has transformed or transferred, rather, into the hands of affordable housing developers in partnership with the City of Bend. The first property is adjacent to Greenwood Avenue, which is an important part of the community there, went to Habitat for Humanity, who developed a triplex that families moved into this year. As a result of the work the team did on the Greenwood property, we've built a strong partnership with the City of Bend's affordable housing program. The city itself has also looked at their own surplus property for sites to develop for affordable housing. So ODOT is actually leading the surplus housing, surplus property housing conversation and community. And it's fairly rare that ODOT has residential property that ends up in the surplus property list. Special thanks to David Brown and Lad Whitcomb for their great work and creative thinking. So I just wanted to note that I know that this is happening in other parts of the communities uh, around Oregon, um, really setting the pace in terms of what we can do to think outside of just transportation, but how, in fact, we touch lives in each and every community. So with that, I'll turn it over for director's report. Madam Chair, thank you. I appreciate that. That is uh, an innovative approach, and Region 4 has led the way in terms of um, surplus property. I'm sure they recovered the fair market value of that property. I'm sure that was part of the business deal. Uh, but it actually spurred a greater conversation. There is now a significant effort, uh, an RFP uh, um, out on the street from the Regional Solutions team, which ODOT is one of the five uh, state agencies as part of it, looking for opportunities for workforce housing, uh, kind of that missing middle, so to speak, here, and looking uh, at the issue that ODOT can bring to the table, surplus property, being the ones who will certainly go to school and the professionals in Region 4, what they've accomplished. There's an opportunity that's playing itself out in Hood River, uh, excuse me, the Dallas, I believe it is, um, Hood River County, let's just put it that way. Uh, we are revisiting, as, uh, as you said, not only our surplus property, but our brothers and sisters across um, um, Local jurisdictions are doing the same thing, just to see, might the stars align? In addition to that, agencies are bringing uh, revenue streams to see if we can make the investment to make sure that people have a home. Um, job to market conversation, the implication to the transportation, the jobs housing balance, very important because they're going to use the road to get from point A to point B. So I appreciate you bringing that up, and I do salute the, uh, the professionals at Region 4. And on that similar theme, the Commission will recall that to back in October at the Transportation Commission formal meeting, Region 4 Manager Bob Bryant delivered a presentation on the decommissioning of the US 97 Wikiup Junction project given some significant settlement within the embankment areas of the newly constructed bridge. Remedies to stabilize carried a high degree of uncertainty uh, and the cost to remedy were deemed prohibitive. Thus action was taken by the Commission. Now, simply put, ODOT's normal ge geotechnical practice did not identify this vulnerability. At the time, the OTC expressed grave concern about why that happened, how it happened. I think the, the simple questions were, how do we prevent this from happening again? 
and most importantly, what are the lessons that we bring forward from this event here. At the time, I shared with the OTC that I had called for an independent review of the agency's practice um, in a, a geotechnical practice on a comprehensive basis here. And what I'd like to do with you is kind of provide the Commission right now where we stand uh, in a timeline because more information will come from this review and it will come to this Commission at the appropriate time. Um, so with that, know that uh, the Federal Highway Administration was engaged in late September 2017 and they agreed to perform a review of the ODOT geotechnical processes and practices related to project delivery. So it is a comprehensive review. FHWA Resource Center was engaged. This is a, um, a facility down in Denver that have, that have subject matter experts that they draw upon to inform these types of reviews. Uh, the, the Resource Center uh, has reviewed uh, dots around the country so they have seen a variety of organizational structures and geotechnical discipline uh, and processes that they can bring forward and hold up against the Oregon Department of Transportation's effort here. The review itself, I say, is comprehensive. We've asked this review panel to evaluate the ODOT geotechnical discipline's technical capacity, the organization's structure, statewide staff disbursement, uh, the support and mechanisms against the standard of practice or the best practices in geotechnical disciplines, as well as to take this information, come back and provide recommendations to strengthen as appropriate. In addition, we've asked them to evaluate the geotech quality control quality assurance program and again, provide the appropriate recommendations as appropriate. The, re the review team will has selected six projects across the whole of the state for this review. Uh, there's one project in each ODOT region and then there is one consultant design project as well. The projects have a wide variety of geotechnical aspects including retaining walls, bridge foundations, landslides, rock slides, uh, drilled shafts and large embankment. Let me assure you that Wikiup Junction is one of the projects that will be specifically reviewed. At the end of this month, the end of January, the review team will meet with me, Highway Division Administrator Paul Mather, ODOT's Chief Engineer Bob Pappy, and FHWA Division Administrator Phil Ditzler for a preliminary report on their findings to date. The final report and recommendations will be delivered to this department no later than the end of March, uh, and we will bring that report, those findings, and the recommendations to the OTC uh, as a formal agenda item, most likely in April if things stay the course. So, Madam Chair, this is just an update continuing with a conversation that began back in October with regard to a, um, a significant issue uh, in project delivery. I think the second thing I'd like to share with the Commission are just some key transportation indicators. I do this every so often just to tell you where we are as we compare where we stand now to where we were last year, specific to uh, vehicle miles traveled. Um, we have seen, um, for the most current information we have, an increase of about nine-tenths of a percent compared to the same month uh, of the previous year. Uh, cumulative, cumulatively for 2017, Oregon's VNT is up slightly from last year. This is also true for the states of Washington and Idaho. We're also seeing a little stronger positive VMT growth in the states of Nevada and California. As we look to preliminary traffic fatalities uh, for the month of November, that's where we have the most current information. We're lower than we were the same time last year, cumulative for 2017. Fatalities are about 14 percent lower um, and 17 as, than they were in 2016. The motor fuel gas tax revenue was higher compared to the same month last year. As a result, year-to-date revenue growth has increased slightly by about 1.8 percent. You monetize that, that's about $7.6 million compared to the same period in 16. Go to the trucking side, the weight mile revenue has increased compared to the same month as uh, 2016. As a result, it's pushed the uh, up to the, the, the uh, year to date revenue growth to 2.2 percent or about $6 million compared to where we were in 16. As of uh, December, the total number of Oregon participants uh, has declined, falling uh, by seven particip participants to 699 
active folks in that program. And then finally, specific to passenger rail. And as a direct result from the Washington derailment, passenger rail ridership in December declined relative to the same month in 2016. The drop reversed gains that we saw in August. <clears throat> this reduced ridership total for the year uh, by uh, about a 2.1 percent increase or a little almost 2,400 riders. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, those are some indicators that are flowing out, flowing out there that I thought I'd share with the Commission, and that concludes my Director's report. Excellent. Thank you, Director Garrett, and I very much appreciate the update, although I know not complete, but I think from a transparency uh, perspective on Wikiup Junction, um, as noted in October, um, we will have challenges. And, but we will have only failed if we did not learn from what occurred. So I appreciate that very much. Um, and the other piece, just for those that are, that are here, we did receive an up, uh, a briefing in terms of uh, what's happening with Amtrak. Uh, so um, that's a tragedy today that was, marks one month. Um, and we are making sure that our system is safe and meets the needs of those that are traveling on our system as well. So uh, thank you. So with that, public comment. Do we have anyone? Okay, I've, no one has signed up. But does anyone feel the need to approach the commission? Okay, just let us know. So we will go on to item C. Uh, this is an item that I asked to have brought back, uh, discussion about our staffing needs, and we will also have an update on our implementation plan for House Bill 2017. So Ms. Horner, Ms. Silva, Mr. Mather, who would you, uh, are, will you be leading? Okay, great. Good morning, Chair Beeney, members of the Commission, uh, Leah Horner, ODOT Government Relations. Um, I appreciate the time this morning. I think we started this conversation uh, last month about our ongoing fiscal request that we'll be bringing forward to the legislative body in the February 2018 session. Um, I think if you'll recall, at the tail end of session, um, we were asked to bring forward just the six month um, fiscal needs that we would have to just kind of get House Bill 2017 off the ground with the expectation that we would come back in the February session and now um, the additional expectation that we will have the opportunity to come back with a policy option package for the 1921 session to continue to refine what our fiscal needs look like in both biennium. So um, what we have before you is um, a request to accept what we have already submitted to the Legislative Fiscal Office. Uh, given the timelines, which were uh, uh, granted a little bit awkward, our deadline to submit to them for consideration in February was last Friday. So we did submit what we had discussed um, with you in December um, last Friday, and so we're bringing that forward um, uh, as a request for acceptance uh, for us to continue that conversation with the legislative body um, as we move into the February session. Um, so with that, that's kind of the, the overview on that piece. Um, and Mr. Mather is here to discuss a little bit more about the uh, Section 71 um, project delivery components as well as the document that we discussed last month as well. There have been some edits to that that I think that uh, he'll touch on too. Good. Thank you, Paul Mather, Highway Division Administrator. Um, Last month, I went over the uh, delivery approach that we have to House Bill 2017. You also heard from ACEC um, that we've been working with closely in developing this approach. Uh, we've continued to work with them over the last month. Uh, you'll notice in your packet is an updated version. It no longer has the draft uh, mark on it, and uh, we consider it uh, final. In that uh, document, we talk about um, our approach to delivering. House Bill 2017, we have three scenarios that are in there. Basically, one is a business as usual. Uh, the other is a um, what if we outsource um, uh, everything um, and what that means to um, um, us as a, as, a, as a division, a department in delivering projects. And then the third alternative is our recommended one, which is transitioning to um, uh, kind of our peak level that we've experienced over the last uh, 15 years delivering the, the major programs or of a 70 percent outsourcing. Um, it also allows us working again working with ACEC we developed five principles that we use to develop this um, alternative um, and we use those principles to guide us in developing um, the preferred alternative or the recommended alternative for uh, for staffing and our, and our approach. 
uh, one of the key ones of those uh, key principles is that we have kind of a viable organization, um, uh, a strong professional, a strong owner role is what we describe. So as a consulting or anybody doing business uh, with ODOT, they need professionals on our side to give them clear answers in a timely way as we move through projects. Um, and the alternative we have, we think, does that um, um, and moves us to a significantly higher level of, uh, of, out, of outsourcing and minimizes the amount of positions that we, that we do need. So I, I guess without going back through the, everything that I went through um, last time um, through the document, I guess I'll just take, maybe take questions on uh, anything you see in changes in the, in the document or any other questions you've had since my presentation last month. Please. Um, thank you very much. What, it, so in our proposal to the legislature, what in that is not related to uh, HB 2017? Are, are, is it strictly related to technical corrections and funding to implement well, it, it, the legislation? Everything from a staffing standpoint is directly related to a section of the bill and in implementing okay. the bill. So all our position requests and our, our funding requests are related to, to the bill. Okay. Thank you. Please. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Paul, quick question. I didn't even understand why scenario one was even an option. Is it is it truly even feasible to implement yeah. HB 2017 with scenario one? Uh, Commissioner Simpson, we don't recommend either one or two um, for, for different reasons, but they're just there as reference points kind of as, as bookends as we were kind of zeroing in. People would ask us those questions uh, what if you didn't do get any more positions or what if we just kept doing business as usual? They're just kind of there to describe uh, reference points as we really zeroed in on our approach. Please. I thought we did this one so we can see it better. We put buttons and everything so we can be foolproof, kind of yeah. like you say in here, mistake proof. but. Yeah. Uh, and I apologize, Paul, because I wasn't here last month, so for me it's catching yeah. up, and I appreciate just even the introductory that there is a recommended process right. uh, going through with Scenario 3. Right. I, too, am very concerned with hiring the quality that we need in this environment. Yeah. And how, what do you need from us? How can we be better advocates? How can we make sure that we're giving you the right direction right. so that we hire the quality for long-term engagement, and, and if we look through the whole House Bill 2017, it'd be great if it was two years. It's not. Right. So how do we make sure that we help you the most in getting Scenario 3 to be the best deliverable for the state? So hiring quality employees in, in the job market we are in is very challenging. We've got uh, competition from the private sector as well as neighboring states uh, for the same pool of employees. In particular, what everybody is after right now is that seasoned project manager. Um, and looking back through our economic cycle 10 years ago, we were in a downturn um, from a project standpoint and those students coming out of school during that time, which should be that 10 year season project manager right now had a hard time finding jobs. So there's a deficit in the market right now um, of that season 10 year project manager employee that all of us are kind of fighting for. So to help us be competitive in that market, um, the work that we're doing on our strategic business plan to make us a healthy organization and make us an attractive organization for employees to come and work. Uh, the other piece is salary, and we we're going to have uh, conversations with the governor's office as well as with the legislature about how we can address uh, salary, in particular uh, with the, the manager's uh, leadership positions. Those are the most key, those project managers, um, our area managers. Uh, those are the key positions that are going to be uh, instrumental in delivering successful projects. So uh, any help that, that you have, any opportunity you have to help support us in those requests uh, for uh, additional salary um, and then to, to help work with us on our CG business plan, which is later on the agenda, just to make us a healthy organization and an attractive organization for people to want to work. And I think just a quick follow-up mm -hmm. with that, when we're looking at 70% outsourcing, they those of our partners outsourcing, they're going to be facing the same right. concerns we are. Right. Uh, you can't grow a 10-year seasoned veteran overnight, and we right. all know that. Right. Uh, so it's, it's really 
managing risk goes back to some of the comments we had earlier, managing risks with young employees who have the potential or we wouldn't hire them right. in the first place. Right. Right. And getting those younger employees to accept and stretch into a role right. that lets them be seasoned a lot earlier than 10 years. Right. So I, have, have... I really appreciate that you bring this forward. I appreciate some of the struggles that all of us will be facing. Right. I think this is something that we need to keep our eye on Mm -hmm. and really watch that employment growth yeah. and make sure that we have the tools to keep the right people, let go of the ones that aren't going to be the right people. And you can yeah. see that right. Uh, right. It takes longer than six months, and that's the problem that we have with mm -hmm. some of our, uh, our hiring processes now. We may want to look at some of those also. Thank you. Good. Please. Uh, Dan Brooklyn. Um, I'm not sure where where exactly uh, this question goes, but do do we have um, other requests to the legislature outside the scope of 2017? I mean, is there anything that, or is every request we have uh, before them related to 2017? Uh, Commissioner O'Halloran, the only request that we are going into the 2018 session with is this request for House Bill 2017 okay. FTE. Okay. So, I don't, um, and you can tell me, Madam Chair and Mr. Director, where this goes, but w one of the issues as a commissioner in Portland that, uh, that is brought to my attention just repeatedly um, <coughs> and by some high profile people who care is just uh, the issue of garbage and how much trash um, there is along our highways and on our property. And it's not just. Uh, in Portland, but it, it seems to be a growing concern. People are saying what they can do about it, what, what's the commission doing about it, what's the department doing about it, and when culturally did it become acceptable? And I remember growing up here, it was keep Oregon green, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a single piece of litter was, was really unacceptable. So I guess where I'm going, and, and I'm not sure that this is appropriately part of this conversation, on this agenda item, but I want to figure out, since we don't really have a new business part, you know, is it an issue of us not having funding to do it? Because uh, I would personally go to the legislature and say, we need more money to do this. Or is there a prohibition in law that prevents other parties from participating in this for safety reasons, uh, adopt a highway or whatever it happens to be? But. Um, and maybe this is just an, ag an agenda item for a prospective commission meeting to figure out are there laws that prohibit us from getting on top of this. Um, and, and literally, I bet you I've had 30 people say, you know, I know this is ODOT property, you're on the commission, what are you guys doing about it? So, um, and it's not just Portland. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, anyway. I'm not sure it belongs in this agenda item, but I didn't know where else to bring it up. And you can tell me we'll address it later and have a conversation and and run through the department's um, plan and capability there. But I'd also at some point like to discuss how um, are there things that we can do, changes in the laws that need to be made that would facilitate um, help here. Um, to, to really make it, uh, you know, beautiful to drive along our roads. And I'm not saying that every piece of infrastructure is gorgeous, but I'm just saying that our, they're just the garbage. It just really is amazing, and I just um, think we need to address it. Um, Madam Chair, Commissioner O'Halloran, I will tell you there are conversations um, that will bring in the department uh, specific to um, – garbage, homeless issues, and the rules that we have to play by. Uh, I think it's going to come, there is, there is legislative conversation about some vehicle that may play itself out in February. Uh, we're part of those conversations. You are exactly right. Um, I think we all see it. Um, as best we can, we try to keep up. Uh, our investments that come out of our maintenance portfolio 
and I'll just use I'll use Portland, but you're exactly right. In the urban areas, it's starting to grow. But let us use Portland because I have probably been approached by similar folks saying, "What are you doing about it? You're supposed to be the director here. It's your property." Well, we're doing um, as best we can in terms of reallocating funding, which comes from our maintenance portfolio. So the activities that have uh, been invested in to date have more than doubled from about a half a million dollars to a million dollars. We're engaging the private sector to help inform that. But we're governed by both statute and case law here. So we have some rules of the game that present an awkward situation in terms of the timing in which we can engage a situation. We must post. There's a specific protocol where we have to post our property site in order for us to um, remove materials. I hesitate to call it trash. Some of it is. Some of it is personal property. Mm -hmm. And we have an obligation to inventory that as well. So there's a, there are rules of the game that we must play by that are different than the city of Portland and maybe some of the counties in the, in the greater Portland metropolitan area. I think there is a conversation that syncs that up in terms of uh, some of the strictures that are placed upon ODOT and how we can con conduct business in terms of the timing of our engagement, when we can get there, uh, and when we can remove things, and then how we remove them, how we inventory or bag and tag and store those, uh, that property. Uh, it's different than trash. We have, again, youth litter patrols. We have our maintenance people. We have uh, the adopt-a-highway individuals that uh, as well as inmate crews that we have a cycle that we put people out on highway 26 or 405 or the 5 or the 205 84 um, we are increasing our revenue this is coming from the finite amount in the maintenance portfolio that, that is happening we've had conversations with the city of portland uh, on the opportunity maybe to sync up some of the timing and the inventory issues that are out of sync between our jurisdictions and there's a frustration there um, but they are, they are governed by different rules than we are. So might there be a legislative vehicle that brings in sync uh, what we have to do by statute as well as what we have to do by settlement or case law that has determined the way we have to do business here? We're having those conversations as we speak. So, Leah, that's my perspective. I know you've had some conversations across uh, the, the street in the hallways there. Is there anything you need to add? So, Mr. Director, yes, if sir. I could just uh, respond to that. Uh, it's exactly my point and exactly why I bring it up in this conversation. If there are rules and laws that need to be changed to allow us to get after this um, problem, isn't this the opportunity to, to raise those and to get them fixed? And if we have a short window, a short legislative window, uh, does that, aren't we kicking the can a year? For the next legislative session, if we know what the changes are that need to be fixed now, you're saying there's finite money. Do we need to request for more? I mean, what what is it we need to get after and we, we need to get fixed? It sounds to me like you know what the restrictions are and, and there ought to be uh, uh, something for us to do. And if it's outside the scope of 2017, I, I get it. But um, if we need more money, if we need more people, if we need a change in law um, to sync us up with the city or wherever else. And I know there's one issue in Portland about people camping on our property um, and what is considered personal property, but this is much, much broader than that Correct. and what I'm talking about. And, and if you were to take just the city of Portland out of it, we still have a big issue. If there's a law that needs to be changed and or, or uh, there's some reason we don't want private sector support to do this. You know, can we define it, and and shouldn't we be going to the legislature to say, hey, you guys, we need your help fixing this? So that's that's my question, and why I bring it up in the context sure. of, of of a legislative session. We, uh, uh, Commissioner O'Halloran, we actually have language. We've sat down and worked with these folks. We can put what we think is a solution on the table uh, in terms of of using. Um, Again, public or private funds, we, we have that opportunity. That's available to us. But more importantly, correcting some of the statutory uh, restrictions, I would call them, or disciplines, uh, as well as some of the settlements coming out of lawsuits and stuff. Mm -hmm. 
we have language that says, hey, if we pursue it this way, we become a little more coordinated, which allows us to engage in a more synchronized manner, using the same discipline, respecting, um, respecting all's right uh, okay. and property. So that we have ready language to pursue in 18. The question is, will it be pursued in 18? That's not my call. I have the language to move forward because I see the problem. I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm not hesitant to do that. Um, we'll see what plays itself out at okay. the legislature. And again, I'm not meaning to derail this particular agenda item. No, it's a good question. But, but I just, I don't know where else it comes up, and it does come up. Is there a legislative request that needs to go forward supplementary to what's in here? And, and that's really fundamentally my question. But I just, you know, how do we facilitate getting after it? Um, and what can we as a commission do to, to do it? So if it's an agenda item for a future commission meeting uh, to discuss kind of what, what are the rules, what is, what is our funding, what is our process, what is our team of people, um, what are the options, I would maybe that's something we ought to tee up. Um, but I just think it's, uh, it's almost epidemic stage. Yeah. So let me, uh, Commissioner Brown, okay. I think what would be beneficial is if we could, what I'm hearing is we'd like a briefing on what it is that we are um, looking into for the legislature as well as whatever legislative concept or what we might be proposing. I know we are really limited on time over the noon hour, but if we could actually add that to our lunch discussion or if there's something you could look, we could look at. Uh, if it's not ready for prime time, uh, let no. me know. But I'm hearing that we need to be apprised of what it is that we're, intending to propose? Absolutely. Okay. Um, Chair Beatty and Commissioner Holloran, I would also identify that um, we are in uh, discussions right now about accepting private donations to go out and help with some of the um, the trash issues, if you will. And that is, um, in my mind at least, uh, an issue in and of itself because we would not need any statutory fixes or um, legislative input in order to negotiate and carry that piece out. The um, the homeless issue and the cleanups is the other piece of this puzzle, which we do have some suggested language that I'm happy to share. Excellent. So if we could Thank take you. that into, uh, you know, our uh, lunchtime is a work working session for us, open to the public. If we could have a brief uh, briefing, that would be beneficial. Yep. Thank, thank you for the indulgence. I, yes. I wasn't meaning to, to, to go off on a tangent, but I did want to get clarity about where's the appropriate place to raise it. Yes. And this is the appropriate place. Commissioner Van Brocklin. Uh, just very quickly, uh, two questions. One is we have positions authorized today. I think it's 36 positions. And I asked this question last month, so I, I'm asking it again, mainly because uh, Commissioners Simpson and Brown weren't here. But how are we doing on the positions we already have authorized? Uh, what are you seeing in the market? Uh, and what's that telling you? That's question one. Question two is uh, with respect to Commissioner Brown's question about outsourcing, um, it seems to me we have, we have dual objectives here. One is we, we increasingly are reliant on outsourcing to get the work done. That's not going to decrease. It's probably going to increase with the flood of work in front of us. But we also have the objective of building in long term a, an ODOT workforce, uh, which has institutional knowledge which has experience and which can manage the firm over time. So there's, there's, there's short-term, long-term tension there. Okay. Uh, and there, are, there is some work we obviously want done in, internally for a variety of other reasons. Okay. So the first question is about how are we doing on the 36 positions we already have? Are we filling them? What's our experience? And do you expect that with position, future positions that are authorized that we're going to have whatever experience we're having now, we're going to continue to have. Uh, and the second thing is about this split, because it's of interest to me, and I'm sure others, uh, what kind of organizational structure we're going to end up having. I mean, it, it, in particular, are we going to, is there a point at which outsourcing works against building a long-term viable agency? There you have it. Yeah, so to speak to the first point about filling the positions, we've been um, working through filling those, and we've had 
uh, relatively good at success. I think one of the competitive advantages that we have in the market is we have fairly good, high-paying jobs in rural Oregon. So if we're hiring engineers in the Grand or Bend or Medford or Roseburg, uh, that's a very different market than the Portland area. Mm -hmm. um, we are struggling in the Portland area. In fact, we've had uh, we've lost several employees that have been um, hired away by other other agencies recently. Um, that's been our struggle. As I guess if I project ahead. Um, there's going to come uh, a saturation of those people that may want to move uh, to some of those places in Oregon. Um, I'm not sure where that's going to be, but I think we're going to run into that. So the first 36 are, um, we've, we're, we're doing okay with, um, but uh, I'm still worried about as we get to, to more um, how that market is going to unfold. Um, you know, to your question uh, around what kind of agency that we become as we transition into 70 percent outsourcing, that was part of those principles that we developed with ACEC to ensure that we don't become a contract administration only agency that doesn't know anything about transportation. We still need to be the state's expert on bridges. We need to be the state expert on transportation. Um, and so that's the, sev the 30 percent um, that we wanted to make sure we maintain some level of expertise. So when we answered consultants' questions, we put consultant bid packages together, we understood the work we were asking to perform and answering those questions and why we didn't want to go to that 100 percent um, and just turn into a contract administration agency. We still needed to be the state's transportation experts um, in operating and owning um, a highway system. So is the 70-30 split, is that about as far as you go? Could you see us being an 80-20 agency, 85-15 yeah. yeah. agency, or where's the yeah. tipping point? And secondly, of the 36, how many have we hired? Um, where's that tipping point? Uh, we're going to learn as we go through this. We, what we did is we looked back, <coughs> and we looked back at the peak of our outsourcing during our bridge program, uh, during JTA, and we hit that 70, 30 percent under that. And that felt like about right or about the most we could do. But as we ratchet into this, this isn't going to be our only conversation about positions. Uh, there's no positions in this request, for example, for Rose Quarter Project or for those, the, the triggered amounts that get added if we hit the, the various triggers. We're going to be back having this question, and we're going to be more knowledgeable as we go through the hiring. Uh, we see actually, you know, uh, how this question kind of plays out. Is 70-30, 75-25, 80-20, 60-40? Uh, we'll refine that as we go forward, and it's certainly something we're watching, and we'll be getting feedback from the uh, consultants as well as to ensure that we're um, meeting their expectations and getting timely, um, timely response. Exactly where we are in filling the positions, um, I don't have that in front of me. I know we just talked uh, yesterday with the region managers about filling one of those key um, consultant project manager positions, and I think we've got all of them hired but one um, around the state. We seem to have good pools, good candidate pools around the state. I, again, the exception being the Portland area where we seem to be struggling um, and will likely continue to struggle and then hit that saturation point, I think, elsewhere in the state, too, at some point. Thank you, Paul. Uh, for future meetings, since, as you say, we are going to be talking about positions going forward for, I suspect, quite some time. Maybe if we could have periodic updates about kind of Good. what we've done and what we've got to do. That would be helpful, I think, for us. Uh, so, we, so we kind of had a, it didn't have to be to the person, but right. you know, ballpark, we've fi we filled half of them. We've got yep. three quarters of them filled, yep. something like that. Yep. Give us some, some uh, measurement of how we're doing and how we're progressing. Good. We'll do Thank that. Thank you. So I, I, one of the things we might need to look at down the road is do, do we have to do a geographic cost of a living cost of living adjustment? I know at the yeah. federal level that's done. I mean, obviously, someone in New York City or L.A., it's, it's very different. Um, but also, I think, uh, and we've raised this before, about are we cost competitive in, in our recruitment? And um, as we address this, are we being honest about our retirement bubble here? Um, about who's eligible to retire going forward, and are we losing a lot of institutional knowledge as we look to implement these major programs mm -hmm. as 2017 ramps up? Um, at the same time, the pressure's on the department to do more. Are we seeing more people eligible for retirement, and, yep. and do we have a, 
a perfect storm in our ability to execute. And so I, I, I raised it before, but I think it's, yeah. we just have to be honest about what's our, can we retain talent? Can we recruit talent? And are we being cost competitive? And, um, and, it, and it is a relevant conversation in a legislative context because do we need to go in and say we need a waiver to, to up the salary caps and to, or to up the number yeah. of full-time employees, whatever. And I, th I think it's a very relevant conversation. No, I, I think all, all the questions are pertinent and they're right in front of us right now. I think to Commissioner Van Brocklin's um, request, and this won't be to the person, but we did submit to the legislative fiscal office of those 36. I think there are 26 that have been hired or in the process of hiring. There are 11, I think, and I may be off one there to be doing the math there, but it's, um, there are 10 or 11 that we have yet to engage. So that's kind of where we are with that first 36. To Commissioner O'Halloran's point, you were spot on. And in the, uh, that ACEC document, there is a narrative, narrative that speaks to exactly some of the vulnerabilities or the threats that exist. What we know right now is if you do a market comparator to our professional engineers, we are about 17% uh, out of alignment with market. Um, so to Paul's point, we are having conversations to see if there's any way we can bring in um, a compensation adjustment that at least from a financial standpoint puts us in the game. I will tell you Caltrans just gave their PEs a, a 10 plus percent increase um, because again, they're significant investment package and they're competing for the same folks. So we're just trying to, from a financial standpoint, we're trying to, to, uh, to be on the, the same level. That is a conversation that is engaged and ongoing as we speak. The second issue you broach is the, the retirement bubble. It plays itself out in a unique manner specific to project delivery where you have, um, let's say, the labor side at about 30-some percent. Uh, but when you get into the management in the project delivery discipline, uh, it increases to 40-plus percent mm -hmm. here. And again, depending on whether you're three to five years in duration. So we're seeing the eligibility rate in that discipline actually higher than the eligibility rate for the agency as a whole. So that's another vulnerability mm -hmm. in terms of people moving out of the agency. Um, the, the back end, as Commissioner Brown spoke <coughs> about people moving in to mm -hmm. the agency, receiving the young, bright kids coming out of university as engineers and how do you how do you turn them from green to seasoned as quickly as possible here that is a risk management discipline as well so I think you uh, Commissioner you have captured exactly the conversation that has played itself out to date as we have met with legislators in preparation for the 2017 legislative session and a conversation that will continue to play itself out because it comes to Commissioner Van Brocklin's core question how do you remain with a core competency skill set at the Oregon Department of Transportation. That's what's in front of us right now. And the vehicle to have this is House Bill 2017. Thank you. A uh, couple of comments. So you are requesting that we accept this particular piece, which is scenario three. One of the questions that I have is right now we have some concurrent things running and that is our discussions with our partners in terms of project delivery and what what we need to make that shift in terms of outsourcing. What flexibility, this is a cap. I would understand the, the number of FTE that you were asking us to accept and approve for in the future. Um, and I do wanna note that last year, or last month there was a distinction around accepting what we were being, uh, what we were proposing to the legislature, but we have budgetary uh, responsibilities to making sure as we add FTE that there is approval by the Commission making sure that we um, are in alignment there but my question is is there flexibility in terms of the positions that we have identified so that as we have this conversation that's ongoing with our partners and how we stand up this system to deliver 2017 that we have flexibility to meet that need within is are these specific positions that we are wedded to or is there flexibility for us to adjust if necessary that we have other positions that we 
re require yeah. that yeah. are not identified. Help help me with we'll, some flexibility. Uh, Chair Beeney, we'll we'll continue to adjust. I mean, as we learn more about this this program and and our needs and our relationship with uh, ACEC um, and move into this new world of 70, 70, 30 um, outsourcing, we'll need to adjust. Uh, we have our base, a number of employees. Uh, the request that we have for positions, um, we're staggered. We have some this biennium and some next biennium. We'll take those, fill those as requested from the legislature. Um, but we have our, our base number of positions um, as well as the ability to adjust you know, a year from now, two years from now, to uh, continually adjust, just as we did four or five years ago when we actually turned positions in. As we kind of came down the back side of the mountain chart, we were actually turning in 200 positions. So part of our request that we're based on uh, of our approximately 200 positions for project delivery is just reinstating those 200 positions that we turned in uh, over the last several bienniums as we saw a downturn. We'll continue to adjust, continue to have this conversation about our delivery model. Um, it's it's um, imperative on us to manage this. We're not we're not um, going to be locked into positions or a methodology and just blindly go forward. We're going to continue to adjust. Okay, I just want to make sure. Sometimes it's not us that want to be locked in. We get locked right. in. Yeah. Um, so I think we owe it to the legislature that we will fi we will fulfill our commitment of filling the positions as requested and put put in motion our plans as we said to them. But then we're going to adjust from there. Right. Okay. The conversation that we had a couple of weeks ago with AGC was very enlightening in terms of what they see as our needs as well. Right. And we have our new internal auditor who's going to be looking at some of right. our system work. And I just want to make sure that we are. Um, adding FTE in areas that most benefit the system and not, yeah. you know, there's that sweet spot of where we are today and where we might need to be right. and that we have that right. uh, flexibility. Please. Just one more comment, I guess. It's a question, uh, but also a comment, which is um, another thing that I think is important for us as an agency and it's part of our policy and I'm sure culture is to um, ensure that we're also, as we're hiring that we're keeping in mind our diversity objectives, mm -hmm. sure. both with respect to gender and racial mix, uh, yeah. cultural mix. Uh, so if you could just comment on that for a second, because I, I, I think there's a lot of talent out yeah. there, and we need to make sure we're looking at all of the talent that's available to us in this kind of environment yeah. you're describing. Mm -hmm. We should be doing this anyway, right. regardless of the market. Right. So if you could just speak for a second about diversity, uh, because that, that to me is an important part of what we should be trying to do in terms of building the future of the agency. So it's certainly, diversity is certainly a value of the uh, state enterprise and it's certainly a value of, uh, of, of ODOT and we've done a lot of work over the last um, several years and seen fruits from that, that work in seeing that um, our organization become more diverse. But we got a lot of work in front of us yet to do. And we have a great opportunity with these new positions to put a lot of those um, ideas and values in place. Just to give you one anecdotal example, on Monday I'm gonna be interviewing for a senior level position in the organization. And for the first time, I really have seen at that level in the organization a, a truly diverse uh, candidate pool. We had six people that we're going to interview. Three of those are women. Two of them are minority candidates uh, for a senior level position. And ODOT, that's that's the first that I've seen in my career here. And we've seen that you know other places, other levels in the organization, but for senior level management, I I think it's illustrative of the work that we've done over the last several years, and we're starting to see some of that um, come true. Yes. So the class and comp study um, that we are requesting, the state, I know the state is looking at some of the hiring practices, that we're not the only agency that's struggling. In the documentation that you provided to us, there's a comment about that ODOT could act as a pilot for the work. Is that something that is currently ongoing? Is that something that we could um, actually, it, would it be beneficial for the OTC to submit a letter of support that we want to be a pilot? Having just gone through a class and comp study at a, at a county level, um, you know, I don't think we want to be behind the market. I think we probably want to do what we can to maybe lead the market in some respects and uh, other ways in which we compensate that are not uh, only financial. So comments on that? I think, Madam Chair, the, uh, I think the pilot was a concept or a, a conversation we had. I would submit to you the conversations we're having are much more surgical. 
Okay. We're striking right at the heart to see where we're vulnerable, specific to House Bill 2017. Okay. There's a greater conversation. There's little question. There's a greater conversation about the whole of the agency and other disciplines. Mm -hmm. But I think that gets caught, in a, caught up in an enterprise discussion that is uh, just not right okay. right now at the state level. So we're being a little more intentional and a little more direct as to where we're going. Okay. Well, I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of what that means because an agency as large as um, ODOT, it takes all levels to make that work. Yep. And we're not humming if we don't have yep. the right mix of compensation along all lines. I, I think that's right. There's a little question. And I think to, to your point and to Commissioner Brown's earlier point of, of what the com commission can do, I think is an important opportunity for the commission to support the agency in it saying yeah we do understand there is an exposure and a liability in terms of the skill sets that we need the liabilities that exist on many different levels and we would endorse uh, and uh, certainly support and approve where the commission is going to try to again at least in this specific issue align with market so we can compete with the states of Washington California Nevada um, and, and Idaho who have all passed funding packages as well as the private sector, as well as our local jurisdictions as well. <coughs> We're all fishing in the same pond, uh, to put it in a very simple manner. We've okay. got to position ourselves to catch some fish and bring them on home. You bet. Okay, so, Leah, what do you need specifically from us? Um, I think uh, an official acceptance of what we have put forward would be helpful. Okay. I would welcome a motion, and then in future, um, discussions, of course, we had a timeline and et cetera, so um, we would actually be approving FTE, um, additional FTE as they come forward, but this is kind of an awkward hop, so. Ma Madam Chair, I uh, <clears throat> move that we approve uh, the uh, department's plans for implementation of House Bill 2017 in its legislative request for the 2017-2019 biennium. Okay, thank you. Please. Just quick further discussion. I would hope that Commissioner Holloran would uh, move to accept, okay. uh, which is what was asked for by Ms. Warner. So if you would move to accept rather than approve. Well, whatever the uh, uh, appropriate nomenclature, yes, I move to accept. Okay. And it, that's important to me. It is, uh, yes. This isn't after the fact, so accepting for me is appropriate. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for that distinction. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Ms. Silva, would you like to give us a brief update? Sure. Uh, Chair Bainey and Commissioners, um, what you have in your supplemental packet is uh, an updated version of the kind of draft dashboard. Um, you've seen uh, one other version of this uh, last month, and uh, based on the feedback that uh, that kind of initial glance and feedback, um, a couple of small changes have been made um, to the overall document, um, and I can kind of just uh, quickly point those out to you. So uh, there are a little bit of, um, for those of you also that haven't seen this before, um, I, one, the first kind of comment that uh, I received um, was that the categories, some of them weren't um, clear as to, for example, why on hold, uh, why were these specific initiatives on hold? So um, put a parenthetical there just to kind of uh, point out that we're awaiting some additional either legislative decision or direction clarification around language or um, questions that we have um, before we kind of move forward with implementation planning on those specific initiatives. Um, but this uh, kind of plots out uh, all of the OTC specific initiatives across uh, across these four categories and obviously these will move as we kind of get go through time and then um, taking in another point of, um, of feedback um, I was asked to add an OTC liaison column um, to the columns that were here it previously was not there and so I've identified uh, commissioners where uh, kind of those are known um, and I did not um, call those out specifically for the medium or low priority initiatives and I think um, part of the work we'll do later this afternoon in the workshop is to identify where you where you all feel it is appropriate to identify um, a commission liaison and then we would add those um, add that column and those uh, 
specific commissioners in there. Um, and so uh, the additional details column, not a whole lot has changed. I've added dates where dates have uh, revealed themselves, um, but really wanted to leave that the same for those commissioners that haven't had a chance to review this. And, and um, what's provided there in that column really is just an overview of, of um, our kind of proposed engagement and touch points with the OTC with regard to the work that lives in, um, within each of those initiatives. And um, ultimately, we'll take a deeper dive look at this as part of the workshop this afternoon, and, and uh, you'll have a, a chance to really uh, get a better sense and understanding of, of where we're coming, at, where I think the agency is at in terms of proposing um, engagement and timeline, and then you'll be able to provide your feedback and let us know what your expectations are so that we can align there. Um, and so uh, this really is an iteration or an iterative document. Uh, you know, I suspect that as we kind of move through um, House Bill 2017 updates and discussion, the more information that you want to see, tweaks that you want to make, to make sure that we're getting you the information that you want to have, um, you know, we'll definitely be making those changes and bringing it back. Um, in the future, I would imagine that the additional details column would contain kind of uh, accomplishments. We can include uh, information about FTE if that's, you know, hearing that that's something that's desired. Um, so, um, and then we'll also kind of talk about any specific delays. So if one of these status dots were to turn to yellow, we would have an explanation as to why and also um, some reference to the mitigation strategy in place for getting that back to green. Right. And so, um, again, just a brief overview. Um, I've included um, more of the detailed timelines for those uh, high priority identified initiatives. Again, that's still in a tentative uh, priority level um, based on the uh, feedback that we received from you in your homework assignment. Um, and again, all of this is subject to change based on your continued feedback. Um, so open to any comments, questions, concerns. I think what might be best is if we bring this this afternoon and kind of table the comments for at that sure. point so that we don't have um, duplicative conversations Absolutely. unless there's something that's just burning at this point. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, we are a little bit behind. Uh, let's go on to a discussion around Connect Oregon funding. I'm Director sure Garrett, please, all right. Madam Chair, members of the Commission, I'm Matthew Garrett, Director of the uh, Department of Transportation. For the record, I have the privilege of sharing with you uh, where we are in the process specific to the Connect Oregon dedicated projects that are identified in House Bill 2017, specifically Section 71, subsection F here. So you'll recall that there are four dedicated or earmarked projects as part of the Connect Oregon program. I'm here today to speak to two uh, specific to the intermodal facilities here. So in accordance with the Connect Oregon administrative rules that this um, commission approved, ODOT has received and reviewed the pre-proposals for those two dedicated intermodal facilities called out in the House bill. The pre-proposals were due by December 15 as prescribed by rule. All the proposals were made available on the Connect Oregon website for the public and others to review. ODOT received a total of six pre-proposal submissions. The cover letter identifies those six. Um, one in Treasure Valley um, and five for the Mid-Willamette Valley Intermodal Facility. We've taken those uh, proposals on the ODOT uh, professionals in the freight uh, discipline, reviewed all the proposals to ensure that they were complete and had addressed all the required submission elements. Uh, so based on this completeness review, it was determined that one Mid-Willamette Valley pre-proposal had not sub submitted a complete application. This pre-proposal pre submitted by the Northwest Container Services was therefore deemed not complete, and I sent a letter notifying uh, Northwest Container Services that their pre-proposal their pre would not uh, be forwarded to the next step of the review process. And the main reason for this, uh, as to why this proposal was deemed non-complete, was due to the fact that they were not proposing to build 
an intermodal facility at a specific location. In fact, they were simply supporting the notion of an intermodal facility somewhere in the mid Willamette Valley, but wanted to be ones associated with the development and management of that facility. So they did not meet the, the intent behind that uh, uh, proposal specific to location. The remaining five proposals were all deemed complete and advanced to the next step of the review, and that is an adequacy uh, review. And this, was, uh, this review was administered by staff from, again, the freight professionals at the Oregon Department of Transportation, the rail division of the Oregon Department of Transportation, and staff from the Oregon Business Development Department as well. The adequacy review was focused on the sponsor's inclusion of uh, an organizational structure that demonstrated the ability to plan, construct, and operate an intermodal facility, showed clear support from local business, organizations, local governments, and the rail entity which would connect and serve that facility, and provide a general business case outlining the location of the facility, expected commodities to be moved through the facility, uh, preliminary cost estimates for building and operating said facility. On January 16th, um, a couple days ago, the staffs of ODOT and Business Oregon, who completed these, rev these adequacy reviews, met to make recommendations and then those were brought to me as director. Thus, based on the consensus recommendations, I as director have instructed the ODOT staff to do the following. First, inform the Treasure Valley sponsor, which is Mulhair County Development Corporation, that their pre-proposal is deemed adequate and ODOT staff should begin negotiations to develop a project plan as outlined in House Bill 2017 and the Connect Oregon Administrative Rules. Next, <clears throat> inform the Millersburg sponsor, which is the Lynn Economic Development Group, that their pre-proposal is deemed adequate. Third, inform the Green Hill sponsor, Green Hill Reload LLC, that their pre-proposal has been deemed not adequate and that they will not be asked to submit a project plan. Now, the Green Hill proposal was deemed not adequate essentially due to the lack of detail, including the lack of clarity about members within the organizational structure, their roles, their responsibilities, and their experience. There was a lack of clarity about who would ultimately be, ultimately be responsible to manage and operate the facility, and there was a lack of cost estimate and review potential. And no detail uh, on potential customers or commodities uh, were made available who would likely use the facilities. So that's not adequate. And then finally, the ODOT staff um, is to follow up with the sponsors of both the Lebanon and the Brooks locations to address some outstanding questions that I believe need to be answered before we can engage fully that issue. They include clarifying the location of the Brooks facility. The pre-proposal appears to offer and discuss two distinct options, and the project sponsor needs to specify one location. Um, Given the fact that the Albany and Eastern Railroad was identifi identified as the relevant rail entity, the sponsor needs to address how the project intends to meet a statutory requirement regarding funding for the Albany, Albany and Eastern Railroad. Now, this goes back to a 2013 legislative piece of, of language. I think it was Connect <coughs> Oregon 5, where the Albany and Eastern Railroad um, is not eligible to receive Connect Oregon funds if it continues to solicit railroad crossing freeze fees from property owners along the line. Not sure if that's been uh, resolved, so to speak. So with the existing statutory language and the identification as the Albany and Eastern as the relevant rail entity, we need to bring clarification about the, that conflict. Additionally, since the project sponsors are the same for both proposals, um, Lebanon and Brooks, I identical as a matter of fact, the project sponsors need to provide more detail why they are proposing multiple 
specific site locations. Why or how are these pre-proposals different from the, develop the developers or the development entity's standpoint here? We say this because it is the agency's understanding, the Department of Transportation, that the intent of Section 71F of House Bill 2017 is to build one intermodal facility in the mid Willamette Valley. And these pre-proposals <coughs> pre don't quite sync with one proposal there. I have instructed the ODOT uh, staff to engage with the project sponsors of Lebanon and Brooks to address these outstanding questions and report back to ODOT by February 1st, 2018. And based upon the information provided to the agency from these project sponsors, the ODOT director, me, will determine if both, one, or none of the pre-proposals for, for Brooks and Lebanon uh, move forward to the development of a project plan. So Madam Chair, that's exactly where we are in the process. Conversations to move forward, conversations to continue. Um, and I wanted to share that with Commission as we move forward. <laughs> so with that, I'm happy to take any questions. I have Ms. Bohard and Mr. Havik here uh, as they were part of the technical <laughs> reviews. Thank you for the overview. A lot of good work has happened behind the scenes in a pretty short order, so uh, appreciate that. Commissioner O'Halloran. Um, thank you, uh, Director. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so rail entities, do, so are you, when you look at rail, are you talking about just the railroad that will serve the intermodal or, because that's a short line, correct? That's correct. So it has to link up with a main line, and, and have we had conversations with those main line railroads, and if so, are they supportive or have they taken a position? Eric, why don't you share the, the, what is mentioned in the, the proposal and the relationship to the Class 1 railroads? Uh, for the record, Eric Havig, Planning Section Manager uh, for ODOT. Uh, Commissioner Hollern, uh, what we asked for is uh, at least at this pre-proposal stage, a letter of general support and acknowledgement from the rail entity where they would be building the facility. Um, we hope to get more into those details in the project plan of how they're going to be served. Some of the pre-proposals actually did bring um, uh, letters from both, if they're being on a short line, as well as the main line, uh, that they've been working with those entities to talk about potential service and what that might mean. Uh, but it wasn't required as part of the pre-proposal given the short time frames that they had to work those kinds of questions. So we were really focused on the rail entity for where they connect. But you're absolutely right. These, th these intermodal facilities to work, if they are on a short line, we will have to have operating agreements and uh, coordination activities with the main lines to really make them functional. And that will need to be addressed very strongly as part of the project plans. Okay, thank you. And then I guess one other question is, in our proposal, or and maybe this is a next phase question, do we assess the long-term commercial viability of the of the entity? I mean, can it can it sustain itself? So, lots of public sector money to construct it, and and obviously, if there was lots of momentum, the private sector would do this on their own. But do we look at once there is that upfront capital from from the public? Um, assuming it's approved, that is it commercially sustainable and viable, viable without operationally being subsidized? I think, Madam Chair, Commissioner O'Halloran, uh, actually, we want to have that scrutiny before we obligate the, the public okay. money, to be very honest yeah, with you. So you. it is part of the, re the, the next level of review or scrutiny. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. Commissioner Van Brocklin, do you have a comment? Okay. Uh, Thank you. I do, just briefly, Mr. Havik, if you wouldn't mind, I um, had the pleasure of listening to your testimony around Connect Oregon and the streamlining of the application process. Would you mind putting uh, just a few more words behind what our next phase might look like or answering some of the questions maybe that came up uh, over in the legislature in terms of the process and what we were asked to actually present on? Sure. Uh, Chair Bainey. Uh, last Friday, um, I did present to the Joint Committee on Transportation uh, the report that you approved uh, earlier in the fall for streamlining the Connect Oregon application submittal process. Uh, that was one of the first in uh, requirements out of House Bill 2017, so we did submit that report on time. 
and I gave an update on that report to the to the committee. Um, that report really was focused based upon that direction on the streamlining of the application submittal. And there were a few questions from the committee about um, who was involved to inform that report, where did we get our information from. Uh, we did seek advice and, and input from past applicants. We contacted past applicants, staff from the agencies looked at it. So we had a lot of input to inform that. But I would say that a lot of the questions and the emphasis of what the Joint Committee was talking about was more about the overall program, um, not so much just the application submittal process, and where could we can uh, find efficiencies and streamline the project selection process um, and make sure that that is working as efficiently as possible. So there's a number of questions around what we might be looking at. Uh, as you're also aware out of House Bill 2017, the legislature broke the Connect Oregon program into two parts. There's now a part one and a part two. Uh, we are going to have to enter into another rulemaking exercise because we love administrative rules. Um, so we completed for the temporary uh, rule for the dedicated projects and we'll need to enter into another rulemaking process for the part one and part two. And that's where I inform the committee is we can look at the process during those parts we need to find what is really part one and the process there versus part two, which is more of that statewide strategic investment. Are there some opportunities to look at the overall process to leverage efficiencies to make that more efficient? But it would happen really through those processes going forward. Okay. The big challenge, and I also informed the committee of this, is we always want to be as efficient as possible, but we also want to still make sure we're getting the information we need to make the best decisions and investment choices for the state of Oregon and um, making sure projects are really ready. Have they done the work necessary to, to, to be ready to hit the ground? Um, and through six rounds of Connect Oregon, we're still seeing some of those challenges. So while we want to make sure the process is streamlined, we still want to make sure we're making the right decisions. So sometimes those things are counterbalances to each other. So finding the right balance of efficiency and good decision making will be our challenge. Okay, thank you very much. And I know we've been populating a short list of things that we would like to see refined. And so I look forward to that process because I think there are some things that we've already acknowledged that we'd like to take a look at. Commissioner Brown. So very quickly, because again, this is probably the, something the newest for me. I understand the highway side of things. So this is interesting. When you read all the different proposals that have come in, um, for Mid Willamette, they're all very, very different. How do you uh, concisely look at the criteria to go about selecting? I, mean, I think that's, to me, that's going to be the biggest challenge you face because they're all, they all are very different and kind of come at it from a different right. tactic. And, and my assumption is we're looking at how do, we, how do we fold some of those ideas together, but how do we come up with the best idea for the mid realignment? Uh, Commissioner Brown, you're absolutely right on. Um, and the way we tried to design this process is those project sponsors from their pre-proposals that will move forward and we're still working through the, the two, the Brooks and the Lebanon. But once that decision is made, those project sponsors will need to develop that project plan. And as Commissioner Holleran mentioned, there is some detailed requirements out of the Connect Oregon rules that they need to meet. And a lot of it is about the feasibility. Is this a good investment? How is this going to work? And uh, what are your commodity flows, your revenue projections, and is this going to be a sustainable practice? To help us do that review and to help inform your decision, because this will be a Transportation Commission decision uh, later this year, we have a three-step process we've defined in that rule to help inform that. One of those steps is to bring in an outside third-party entity that has experience in looking at freight and freight mobility and economic analysis to really look at these proposals and project plans do they hit the mark? Are, is this something we feel fairly confident is a good investment for the state? We'll also have a review committee made up, very similar to what we've done in Connect Oregon with folks across the state to bring that perspective. And then we'll have recommendations from both the ODOT staff and the Business Oregon staff through the respective directors coming to you to help inform that decision. But there will be choices um, because there are um, strengths around each of these proposals and how do they maximize those. So are there ways for, when it comes down to it, for two of them to say, hey, we really want to partner with each other and make it a better opportunity? Or are we stuck, stuck's the wrong word, are we limited to making a choice of one of the five that have been deemed complete? 
Uh, Commissioner Brown, the way we really interpret the language out of the House bill is this is to build a single facility, one in the Treasure Valley area and one in the Mid Willamette Valley area. Um, and that really is to make sure we're focusing that investment where we can get the best uh, return on that investment. With that amount of community uh, interest, my hope is that there is a collaborative effort that strengthens that particular area. Okay, other questions? All right, thank you very thank you. much. We'll now move on to item E, which is to receive a cost complete report for Abernathy Bridge and Interstate 205, part of House Bill 2017. Madam Chair, members of the uh, Commission, Paul Mather, Highway Division Minister, I'm just going to give you a, just a brief tee up to uh, what I think is a, a very interesting and thorough presentation um, on our cost to complete uh, study for I-205. Um, just as we get ready for this, I remind you of um, the deliberations, conversations that were happy, happening as House Bill 2017 was being created. There was uh, a continual conversation about the three big projects in the Portland metro area, Rose Quarter being one, the project on two, the two projects on 217 being the other, um, and then the I-205, this project was the third. As you look back now on the bill, two of those projects, there are funding for identified in the, in the bill. This is the one project um, that was not, uh, but there's still strong support and strong desire to find a way uh, to fund the project. There is an expectation um, in, in the bill uh, that the commission uh, submit a cost to complete study um, to the legislature by February 1st. And so we've been working hard and, and diligent um, to, to do that and get us to where we are today um, to have you um, accept that report and then um, transmit that to the legislature by that February 1st deadline. And we anticipate doing a similar presentation that we do today um, to them to go through the work the work that we've done. Um, so that's just a quick tee up kind of the background on, on how we got to where we are today. I'm going to let uh, Ryan and Steve um, really walk you through I think is a, a very thorough and, and um, interesting presentation. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Chair Bainey, members of the commission. Uh, my name is Ryan Winsheimer. I'm the ODOT Region 1 manager. Um, and I just wanted to give you just a little bit of background um, as we approach this um, and remind you that I-205 uh, is an important route that connects people to their jobs and freight to market, some of the highest freight volumes in the state. It's also designated as a, a lifeline route that will bring life-saving supplies and services to and through the region after a major quake. As Paul described, the legislature directed us to refine our uh, proposed improvement in this corridor and provide them with a cost to complete report by February of 2018. Given that very short timeline to complete and refine uh, this work, in July of 2017, ODOT hired a consultant team from HDR to help bring additional resources and expertise to this project. Today, we're pleased to share with you the work that ODOT and the HDR team have completed over the past several months and how we propose to reduce congestion and improve safety and seismic stability for this vital corridor. Following my quick overview of this project, Steve Dehoda from HDR will provide an update on project cost, design refinements, and the delivery methods considered. Uh, and I'll finish the presentation with a slide on next steps for maintaining schedule and cost assumptions. Uh, this slide reflects um, some information regarding I-205 congestion, which is continuing to grow, and the road is not serving users as well as it could be. Uh, in fact, this segment has some of the fastest growing bottlenecks in the metro area. From 2013 to 2015, the morning congestion period grew by an hour, <laughs> and the evening congestion period grew from zero to three hours, uh, creating backups that can extend over nine miles. In addition to a longer rush hour, travel times uh, during the PM peak have increased during this period by 40%, adding an additional 12 minutes to that trip. We expect uh, the proposed improvements will reduce peak period congestion travel times by as much as 25% on the day of opening and reduce anticipated 2040 travel times by 50% uh, versus the no build condition. In addition to reducing congestion, this project is expected to significantly improve safety within the corridor. 
Today, crash rates within the corridor are higher than the statewide average, with three segments that rank in the worst 10% statewide near the OR43, OR99, and OR213 interchanges. While all of our improvements in the corridor are being designed with safety in mind, two key types of improvements for addressing safety are the addition of auxiliary lanes to improve merging and weaving distances, like the northbound I-205 auxiliary lane between 99E and 213, which is expected to reduce future crash frequency by uh, between 20 and 30 percent, and the replacement of, signalized uh, of a signalized location with a roundabout at the OR43 northbound I-205 on-ramp. Um, roundabouts have consistently lower crash frequency and lower crash severity than signals, and we expect this roundabout will reduce future crash frequency at this location by up to 40 percent. As mentioned before, uh, congestion and delay are significant issues. For more than 100,000 uh, daily drivers and nearly 9,000 freight vehicles experiencing the 5.5 hours of congestion a day in this area. The operational improvements on the slide, in addition to uh, the addition of a third lane in each direction in the only remaining section of I-205 uh, that's two lanes today will significantly improve the situation, but this project is also very important for meeting our seismic resiliency goals and for reducing the time it would take Oregon's economy to recover following a major earthquake. In addition to uh, addressing bottlenecks, this project includes seismic retrofit and widening of the 2,700-foot long Abernathy Bridge, seismically retrofitting and widening five additional I-205 bridges, and the replacement of eight bridges, which will include meeting our seismic resiliency criteria on those structures. Uh, Interstate 205 is a seismic lifeline route, and this project will significantly increase the seismic resiliency in addition to providing bad, uh, badly needed congestion relief. I'd now like to introduce uh, Steve Drahota. He's our uh, Vice President of HDR Consultants. Steve's our project manager. Uh, for both completing this report and for getting uh, the complete bridge and roadway project uh, package through the design acceptance phase, which is approximately 30% design. Um, today, Steve's going to walk you through many of the criteria we use to complete this report <coughs> and update you on many of the design refinements we've made uh, since the last time uh, we, we shared information with you about this project. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Steve. Hi. Chair Bainey and commissioners, thanks for having me. Um, when we were hired on, we were principally tasked with taking what the work has been done by ODOT and refining it, updating it, looking for ways and opportunities to, to modify the project um, and really validate the information that, that was contained in the initial concept, probably about a 3% level uh, when we received it. Uh, we've since taken it to about a 15% level, looking at those opportunities and benefits, and then updating the cost to what is now in the cost complete re report that you have. And it's, in essence, we performed a cost risk assessment on the, on the overall project. Uh, but at the beginning of this, we wanted to sit down and, and we worked with uh, ODOT's executive team, the project delivery technical team, technical folks outside of the region, um, the consultant team, and contractors to really say, okay, let's how do we approach this, this topic? So we had a few design philosophies that we followed from, from day one. So the first is <clears throat> focus on right-sizing the project footprint. And that's really honing it to match the project goals and objectives. Seismic resiliency, adding a third lane, resolving bottleneck issues and congestion, creating a safe freeway segment within this quarter. Really focus on that. Then secondly, it's discuss and investigate the appropriate phasing of the improvements. So this is how are the various improvements going to be done? And we'll talk about that a little more later. And, and look for opportunities that, that optimize the, the different solutions. Third, tied to the right sizing, is really minimizing right-of-way impacts and environmental impacts. Looking at ways to nudge the center line of the freeway a little bit to avoid obstacles and obstructions to reduce impacts. Associated with that is also making sure that we maintain traffic mobility on the corridor during construction. It's vital, you know, it's a heavily, heavily used freeway and maintaining traffic uh, is, is paramount as part of the project purpose. And last, knowing that it's a focused project, we have to not preclude other improvements that might come at a later date. So whether that's placing our bridges at the right location for the acceptance of a future aux lane in 70 years, or thinking about the way we do our rock cuts, or even focusing improvements to support local agency improvements that come later, 
Um, all of those were taken into account as we ap approach this. So <clears throat> before we get to a really cool animation, 3D animation fly through that we'll show, first want to orient everybody to what is in the project. And everybody should have a handout if you can't see the screen very well that looks something like this. And the way I'm going to walk us through this is start on the far right of the screen, which is really the north end of the project, even though right where this segment is, it actually almost looks west to east. But we'll start on the far north side and slowly walk through the various colors of what the project entails and then get to that fly through animation. So uh, first on the far right is a very dark green, um, almost looks like a rectangle. That's a sign bridge, so an active traffic management symbol. That is an important part of the project. So it's a living uh, sign that will inform roadway users of what's happening, whether it's during construction or post-construction. As we start moving to the left, <clears throat> you'll see a light green, almost looks like a heartbeat, a seismogram symbol. All of those represent a place where we're doing a seismic retrofit and a widening of a bridge. <clears throat> Excuse me. Following that, we have some dark blue um, arrows, those are the two interchanges that are going to be affected by the project. The first one is Oregon 99E uh, on the east side of, of the Willamette River. Uh, and then we have Oregon 43 on the west side. Between the two is the Abernethy Bridge, again that 2,700 foot long bridge that's going to be widened and seismically retrofitted. And then once we get to the west side of the river, there's a, some blue, looks like wrenches. Those wrenches represent bridge replacements. In some places, we had to replace the bridge because it conflicted with where the new freeway center line would go. In other places, you get further to the far west, it really is uh, more cost effective to replace the bridge. And you get some environmental reduction and impacts by replacing the bridge rather than widening and seismically retrofitting. So we, we looked at all of that. And last but not least, the entire orange corridor is the freeway widening itself. So with that, um, we will move to a, a animation, which I think better shows the kind of improvements uh, after it's constructed. So a couple of notes, it's based on a 15% design level, which means inherently things are going to change as we go forward. Uh, but it uh, is what we know today to be true. It doesn't capture everything. There's some miscellaneous structures, like some sign structures or wetland facilities that aren't included, but it captures the, the vast majority of the impacts, I'm sorry, the project improvements that we have. Um, and again, there's uh, some, some tweaks based on, or some information based on our, our survey work that influences how it looks. So uh, I like the way it looks, and it's a good representation of what we're going to have. So I'll walk us through it as it goes. So, okay. So it'll zoom in to, again, that far north end, and it's going to flip around and create a 3D model and start flying us through. Uh, of note is if you see white on the screen, some dark white lines, that's where a project improvement would, would occur. So it starts at Oregon 213 and has a single lane Augs lane uh, between 213 and 99E until that point where we're now widened to three lanes. The first bridge we're going to retrofit is Main Street and then we come to the Oregon 99E interchange, which is really pretty modest in terms of the adjustments. It's really just tweaking the ramps to accept a wider Abernethy Bridge. We're not doing any work on 99E. So widen and retrofit the long Abernethy Bridge and then really tie into uh, one of the more significant changes, the roundabout at Oregon 43, which consolidates the entry and exit points to a single location. By doing that, we're able to remove a northbound on-ramp bridge, which helps to relieve some traffic issues. We remove the Broadway Street Bridge because it's not required, replacing West A some rock cut on the left-hand side, Sunset Avenue is being replaced, and now we're into a fairly long stretch of freeway widening, including that active traffic management sign. At this place, we're, we're adjusting, and you can't see it very well, which is a good thing from an engineering standpoint, where the center line occurs, so we minimize any, any uh, conflicts with obstructions. Uh, we're cost-effectively moving the, the freeway to meet grade, and we get to the 10th Street interchange where we're going to just do a widening and retrofit. The Blankenship Road uh, bridges that we're going to do a widening and retrofit. And then we get into a stretch where now the widening occurs only to the inside. So it's inside the median. And you can still see that it preserves much of the landscaping. 
Woodbine Road is one of the first bridges that we said, you know what, it's more effective and, uh, from a cost standpoint to replace it rather than to uh, widen and retrofit it. And as we get to the end of the project, Johnson Road, this is a place where we take the northbound direction or the left side and move the alignment into the median so that it, it reduces cost overall, it helps to promote safety during construction as we're replacing both the Twalton River Bridges and the Borland Road Bridges. At the end of the day, it'll tie back in to the existing facility at Stafford Road, and just to the west of Stafford Road is where it connects into the existing three lanes that are already are constructed. So that's the overall project, seven miles worth of pretty important improvements, again, to achieve those goals. All right, so with all of that, the question is then, what is the overall project cost? And so we developed an updated total project cost number, which came out to be $500 million. It assumes all of the construction is completed before January of 2025 or by the end of 2024. And that total project cost is comprehensive of the various components you see on the screen, whether it's all the preliminary engineering work, which includes final design, right-of-way acquisition, utility relocations, and construction. Now, on the construction cost methodology, we did something that's somewhat unique <clears throat> at a 15% level. We did a bottom-up build of all the various line items uh, and construction items, and then said, let's break our contingency, or how do we cost the unknowns, because we're at such an early phase, into two types. One is for a construction variability contingency. What that really means is how confident are we in our design versus the kind of things that we have to keep studying as we go forward. So we took every item and said, you know, this one we have high confidence in. We'll build only a 5% additional contingency. Something else, well, you know what? We have to do a lot more research. We have kind of a handle on it. Let's make it more like 20. And so we went through every line item and, and applied this range of 0 to 20. And then on top of that, we said, you know, just the pure unknowns contingency. Because we're so early, things are going to happen that we're not even aware of. Apply 15% to that. <clears throat> so overall, when you sum everything all up, we're at a 27% collective contingency, which we feel is a, is a very legitimate number for where we are in our level of design. The second major point to this is, this is these costs include inflation to the year of construction. And especially based on the uh, findings that ODOT is receiving now on bid pricing, there's, there tends to be a spike in pricing that we're seeing right now. And uh, in speaking with the economists at ODOT, the recommendation is use a simple 3% per year to get to the midpoint of construction. So we applied that into this price as well. So all said, the $500 million project cost is what we are putting forward as a recommendation. Again, it does capture some, some variability in contingency pricing units as well as that escalation. Now, that said, there are still a lot of work to do to come up with uh, exact pricing down the road. And so I want to give three examples that are important for what we would be <clears throat> getting into as we go forward. So Abernathy Bridge Seismic Retrofit, there is a potential for that to, to reduce in costs based on some advanced analysis, but we have to do a lot more work with that. The rock slope removal, I mentioned that briefly. Uh, we're going to be digging into some more investigations about the type of rock, um, how much it's going to be removed, and really how it affects traffic mobility to, to check pricing on that. And that's a, that's a place where the pricing could actually come up as we get into those details. And then last, construction staging, contractor access. Uh, that's a place where we frankly just don't know. We have, a, we have a good feel for it, but it may go up, it may go down. So all in all, where we feel confident about that $500 million, changes should be expected. Uh, where we stand today is we feel that in aggregate that $500 million number is an is a accurate number. So that was the what in terms of what the project is. Then the next question is how should it be delivered? So again, going back to the whole collaborative team, both ODOT executive, the project development team, contractors, construction contractors, our consultant team, we went through a whole series of options six feasible scenarios with lots of sub-options to them in, in how do we break down this project into various parts and pieces. So we started with one mega job, and then we went as far as seven individual construction packages. And, and 
uh, looked at each of those to find where is that sweet spot, the right balance for where we feel the, the project delivery um, and construction staging should land. <coughs> After looking at the six different um, criteria that are on the board, we then evaluated all the way from double negative to double positive. And the alternative that we landed on is really a combination of three packages, two very large, 250 million roughly for package A, which is the Abernathy Bridge itself, the interchanges on either side, and this single northbound Augs Lane that goes from 99 to, to 213. So basically what's shown in yellow on the far north end of the project. A roughly $200 million construction package in blue, which is from the Abernathy Bridge all the way basically to the south, with the exception of ATMs, which is package C. Called it a front-loaded $5 million package, so you can actually get the benefit of having variable message signs out there to help uh, users during construction. So um, this particular alternative satisfied all of the criteria very, very well. In fact, a lot of uh, great input was given by the, our construction contractors to really make sure that, that this was a, a true indication of, of how they would build it. So then part two of how do you uh, deliver the project goes to the delivery method. And so we looked at, uh, with that same group, uh, a suite of different options. So traditional design bid build, which is really low price, so low bid. Uh, we did a modified version of that low bid plus some additional elements for parameters or so qualifications or approach. That's called best value contracting. We looked at design build, which is really where a contractor and an engineer are teamed together to design and construct it. And then sort of a hybrid between the traditional design bid build and, and design build called CMGC. Uh, so in looking at all of those methods, uh, we determined that for package A and B, those large packages, that design bid build with that best value contracting. So with those additional qualifications uh, were the recommended and, and best suited for this. While for package C, <clears throat> the small uh, active traffic management project a traditional design bid bill, low bid approach made sense. Um, using these methods, A, we found that there was no uh, change to the end of construction. Oftentimes, some alternative delivery methods enable you to accelerate construction. We developed a detailed schedule for each of the different methods and found that, frankly, because of design or risk design or procurement and then overall construction, there really was no advantage from a time standpoint to go with an alternative delivery method. Um, and at the same time, we still got uh, what we feel is the best cost, lowest cost, um, well, while uh, getting the right kind of contractors for those unique construction elements, the Abernathy Bridge itself and that rock cut adjacent to live traffic. So, so at the end of the day, uh, these are the delivery methods that we recommended in our report based on, again, a pretty holistic approach to the analysis. Thank you, Steve. Uh, again, Ryan Winsheimer, um, uh, Region 1 Manager. Uh, Trevor, any members of the Commission? Um, I know that was a lot of information, and we want to make sure we leave time for some questions. I know we're running a little bit behind schedule, um, but I do want to make sure that I have a chance to talk a little bit about um, and a little bit of update on, on funding availability and next steps. Uh, as you know, when we began this effort, we had about $15 million to uh, refine our costs and delivery approach as part of this cost to complete report and to continue project development efforts through the design acceptance phase, uh, again, about 25 to 30% design of both the bridge and the roadway work. We expect we'll be completing um, that work in October of this year um, on time and on budget. Um, in order to remain consistent with the assumptions used on, on this chart and in the cost to complete report, additional funding needs to be identified uh, in order to continue the work. As this chart shows how much we would need to get through the remainder of 2018, um, and through 2019, um, and in order to maintain schedule and cost assumptions associated with the, with the report. Uh, delay in project development schedule would likely mean increased future costs as a result of inflation and remobilization associated with stopping and restarting the work, and I believe it was about a $15 million um, per year uh, cost assumption if, if, if delays do happen in that, um, in that area. Uh, and so we just felt it was really important to identify this need now so it can inform the dialogue between the OTC and the legislature regarding this cost to complete report um, as, as we talk about moving the project forward um, and, and beyond. 
And with that, um, I'd like to open it up for some questions. Please, Commissioner Brown. Just comments. You know, it's always scary to me when an engineer says this is going to be really cool, but it was. And I really like the fact that congestion was reduced. Uh, so, you know, I think you guys have looked at this from a, a pretty big picture and really comprehensively big picture, and I like that. Um, I think going into this with your eyes wide open on cost, huge for me, as you all know, uh, and really looking ahead to what are we going to face in the next five years, um, because that's, that's going to be a big deal. Um, probably didn't mean it to look this way. Only one uh, staging site, or is that just what it looked like on the picture? Because you've got to have something on the other side of the bridge. Uh, so I'm assuming you have two. At yeah, least. Commis Commissioner Brown, we have multiple staging okay. locations. We just, I just want to represent that's one. That's fine, and that's sure. what I figured as much because yeah. I thought I can't be, not for seven miles. Um, but I, I really appreciate the the big picture and extensive big picture look at this. Um, you're not trying to just gloss over the top. You're giving us some pretty big ideas, and I appreciate that. And I appreciate the the involvement with the ODOT staff as well. Thank you, Commissioner Simpson. Um, you, you had indicated a, a um, an inflation index that you're using as part of the full cost. What was that metric you used? Commissioner Simpson, when we sat down with ODOT's um, project letting unit, they have an economist, and when we, we spoke with him, he suggested the simple 3% per year <clears throat> to use, even though right now there might be a little bit of a spike in the way the numbers are being presented. He believes that over the long run that's going to settle back down, and so going from 2018 prices, which is what our basis was, out to the midpoint of construction, 3% was appropriate. Bishop Van Brocklin. I think this is probably a question for Paul and Ryan. Uh, so as you look at this uh, when completed, what's uh, the time frame based on population growth, patterns of travel, all the assumptions you make looking forward at uh, a facility such as I-205 before we have meaningful constraints again? In other words, what what is this? Where does this get us? How far out can we go once this is done before we have to do something significant again? I'm not talking about a minor adjustment. I'm talking about a major project on the, on the facility. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Van Brocklin, um, it, it's it's hard to say if if it would be in this particular area. I feel like um, as as you know and you've heard us talk about, this is really. Um, removing that that last two lane section and so at creating that three lane section it 's really adding a lot of additional capacity at that bridge where we have a lot of uh, the, the local traffic it 's really a, because there 's not very many places to cross uh, in that location um, but uh, given even given those constraints, this particular section of, of i two hundred five has managed to to operate pretty well uh, up to this point and so with these capacity enhancement uh, improvements, my expectation is that we, we would need to be getting to a, a lot of other locations. Uh, further north, uh, before we would have to be back into this into this area, and and uh, luckily for us, we actually are addressing a couple of those bottlenecks, and you'll hear a little bit about that uh, later. Um, but but as we look out at the 2040 um, uh, metros metros RTP and and projects as it relates to that, this is really the the main projects in this for the next for foreseeable future. We we do have the uh, uh, the opportunity to look at and have identified the need for a southbound auxiliary lane. Uh, between 99E uh, and 10th Street or, or further, that would be the next sort of thing that would need to, to come. Um, but mm -hmm. we've also looked at, does that need to be done now or is that something that could wait another 20 years? Um, and, and we've found that um, it, it's going to operate adequately at least for the next 20 to 30 years. Thank you. Um, when you reference seismic and widening, are those uh, different pots of money? Uh, at, at this point, uh, what, what the, the, the funding that's been identified here is how much would it cost in order to replace that bridge? There has not been funding identified for how this project uh, is going to be constructed, and so we haven't gone as far as to identify uh, what, what 
um, pots of money that might come from. Um, currently, we've obviously, uh, and, and you guys are aware, we've we've gone through a, an application process with the federal government and part of the fast lane program and the infra grant uh, in order to replace the the bridge. And so, as we start looking out at, at exactly which funding will be used uh, to construct this, that funding has not been identified, and that's going to be uh, part of our process moving ahead is trying to figure out what are the pieces of that puzzle. Um, right now, there there just isn't any funding identified for that, and so. Uh, as we look forward, we are sort of, you know, looking at every opportunity, uh, particularly grants uh, and things that may, may be uh, things that we could add to uh, what's in our coffers today. So we've got a significant risk, like once we get going on this, um, we're obligated to continue to identify uh, funding sources to complete the project. So we kind of have to dive in not knowing uh, <laughs> what what the uh, full funding stream looks like. So we have a an element of risk there that, that could bounce back to us if federal resources were not to be available. Is that correct? Am I am I am I making too yeah. big a leap there just in terms of our, like our risk? Yeah, no, I think that's the really the next question for us mm -hmm. is how do we keep the momentum of this project going forward? As you see in the chart in front of you um, and, and as Ryan's talked, we've got funding to keep this project on track for, through next fall. Um, the 14 million that's on the screen, the 20 million on the screen, that, those funds are not identified and certainly not anything for the full construction of the, of the project. So that's uh, kind of the next question. Now that we understand the cost, we understand this time curve, so forth, um, where do we go and how do we find um, the additional funds needed just to, to keep us in the game and keep us moving forward? Otherwise, the project slips, costs go up with inflation and so forth. Um, but again, as I said in my introduction, this was one, one of the three big projects in Portland that was not funded as part of the, the funding package. Um, and so this question is, um, was known to be before us as we, as we go forward and be part of our conversation with the legislature and, and, and you. Um, as we prioritize our resources. Mm -hmm. So, and then I guess it's one of that. So we'll have exposure going, if, you know, assuming we go forward. And and in terms of uh, size of project from a highway project, where does this rank in terms of the uh, side, large projects that in the state's history and what we have ahead of us? Boy, in the um, state's history, just from a, a, a dollar standpoint, it's it's right up there with uh, you know the biggest ones that we've done. Um, from an overall size standpoint, you know, it doesn't compare to the interstate building of the interstate yeah. back you know kind sure. of back in the sure, day yeah. um, type thing. But with in in real dollars, it's it ranked right up. It, it's going to be on par with the Rose Quarter. So when we, we get to having conversations to consider. Um, similar conversation with you and the Rose Quarter project, these two are going to be kind of right in the same ballpark as far as uh, overall overall costs. Thank you. Please. With that in mind, I mean, that, so 500 million isn't a sneeze. Is this, did this surprise you is the first question. And mm. then the second piece, my assumption is you've included all the things that you would do if you were planning this project. So what things would you take out if you were given something limited, or is that still to be determined as we as we go forward? Commissioner Brown, those are all, I think, questions on the table as we figure out the funding strategy for this. As we were talking in the legislature, the numbers that we were using um, were very similar to this when you apply inflation. Uh, we uh, had conversations about, the, again, the big three. And we presented uh, cost in today's dollars, but um, we were very anxious knowing inflation needed to be added to these very large projects that were going to take years to uh, develop. The numbers that we were talking with the committee about were in very similar to the numbers as you see um, that you see today. Um, the actual phasing, the, you know, the, the scope of the project, all those things are on the table as we figure out a funding strategy for this. We just put together a scenario um, to kind of answer the question, what would you build and what would it cost and what would the timelines be? I think this, this serves as now our reference point as we start those conversations. So 500 million is a, I mean, it's been noted that the challenge is we are, um, we have significant needs in other parts in the state. And so as we look at a priority 
and the capacity and what this gives us in terms of a, of a benefit back, um, there's only so much money in the system and we will need to look at what those phasing mm -hmm. uh, options are. Right. Right. So as we go forward with this, I wouldn't say that yes, the full request is 500 million, that this is the project. I really wanna see us break this down into actionable items that also show the capacity and the benefit to the community and to the system. This is, is this, I mean, can we say today that this is the number one priority and we wanna be moving toward that? And if there are other priorities that we also know within our system need to be um, balanced with this, we're gonna to have to reconcile how we go forward meeting that need. Um, so I, I, this is incredible work. My, my worry is, is this the best way to spend 500 million right, right. on our system well, today given the needs? And I think that's a question for you. What you have here in front of you is our proposal mm -hmm. of the most efficient, the, the most cost effective, most, um, least disruption to traffic way to build this. Um, certainly you can phase this in different ways, but I think as you heard Steve say, you're gonna compromise some of our efficiencies that um, mm -hmm. in our approach. And so your cost numbers over the, the full scope of the project would uh, ultimately go up. Um, so we've took the kind of the, the most efficient, best case scenario is what you have here today. And, I, and again, it's, it's, the, it's the reference point to start the conversation. Mm -hmm is that all those questions you ask are, are ones that um, we need to start working through. This just serves as the basis for the, all those conversations. Okay, thank you. And, and if I might just Please. add, you know, the, the dollars that we've laid out and the timelines we've laid out, again, consistent with trying to advance this entire project and as part of the uh, assumptions that are rolled into it, um, there, <laughs> You could have that conversation even earlier in terms of uh, how much of this money are we going to be programming for design. Maybe we should only move forward with continuing design to the bridge at one point, or maybe we, these are the yeah. kinds of conversations that we expect um, once we turn this report in, which is what we were asked to do by the legislature, directed right. to do by the legislature, um, that it would help trigger some of these conversations about, yep, this is what we want to do, let's go do it, mm -hmm. um, and here's how we, here's some scenarios of how we might get there. Or, okay, now we have this information, what, what, what other options could we look at moving forward? So you are reading my mind. Uh, as we look at the 14 and the 20, how do we make sure, because we scope that and we really, we start to design something and spend dollars toward, we get on the outside um, timeline, we know that some of that needs to be revisited, our costs need to be adjusted, some of the, you know, there could be <coughs> new things that come online that we hadn't considered. How do we, so is it your, um, is it your plan that you would then give us tangible areas in which we would focus? Maybe that's on the seismic pieces on the bridges, or maybe that's the Abernethy Bridge. Maybe that's, and that we uh, cost those and go forward to, with design. So we have actionable pieces, or are we going to be doing the fully loaded with the 14 and the 20 going forward? It, it, my, uh, um, Chair Bainey, my thought w would be, and, and again, there's a, there's a number of different approaches as you were alluding to, would be to keep the project kind of together through that design, through the design phase. And so we have a, a fuller understanding of all those questions that you're asking. Um, and so the $34 million in total um, through that, through the design phase, we, we complete that. And even possibly the additional $5 million of that very first small phase um, would be where we'd stay focused to try to get that funded. Then I think, we have a fuller understanding of all the issues and, and the potentials of ways to approach uh, approach the project. The scenario we have laid out in front of you is two big projects, you know, one of the Abernathy Bridge and one of the balance of the, pro of the project. As you alluded to, there's a number of different ways you can combine those. Uh, from what we've seen in this report, all those are gonna cost you more in time or in money or in congestion. Um, this is the optimal way from our standpoint to uh, to deliver the project, but from a feasibility financially or other things, we got to introduce all those variables okay. and come up with a plan. My recommendation with what I know today would be to um, keep the momentum of the project going through the design phase and through that first $5 million of uh, traffic management phase um, and then kind of figure out the variables from there, how to go forward. Okay. Other comments or questions? Okay. 
Thank you very much. So we need to uh, approve this um, recommendation and uh, this report. If that's the will of the commission. Madam Chair, um, I move to approve the cost complete cost a complete report for Abernathy Bridge and Interstate 205 widening for implementing House Bill 2017 under Section 27C. Okay. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you very much. All right. Next, we have an action item which is requesting the approval of the initial phase one of ODOT strategic business plan and then also accepting the management review implementation monthly progress report. Ms. Bruce, we've been keeping you busy. Welcome. <laughs> yes, you have. Uh, thank you, Chair Banning Commissioners. For the record, my name is Kelly Bruce. I'm the Improvement Program Manager with ODOT and the, the Project Manager for the Strategic Business Planning Process. And yes, we are here today with the uh, initial final plan of the draft um, for your approval. And this is the culmination of several months of intense work by a broad <laughs> spectrum of the agency, the commission, and our consultant partners, Pivotal Resources, as you would call. And uh, it really marks a significant milestone in the process. This is the first leg of a three-step um, three journey that we've been on. And it's the first critical step which sets our priorities and our vision for the next five years to guide and align our management structure and business efforts um, to a common set of desired outcomes. Oh, sorry. I don't have my clicker. There we go. Um, last month, the commission, you reviewed the majority of the plan content um, and provided guidance and direction. And as a result of that input, um, we've made some changes in these three areas primarily. Um, the relationship between the authoritative documents and the plan. So on page three of the actual plan document, um, if you have that in front of you, you can refer to that um, or you can go back to it later. Um, it was revised to really reflect the relationship between the core policies um, put forth by the commission for the transportation system in Oregon and the, that relationship with this plan. Our mission is really the key link between them. So the primary focus of the strategic business plan is on enhancing our organizational fitness in order to deliver on our mission more effectively and efficiently. That really supports the McKenzie management review findings related to strengthening our internal management structure and practices. The missions have been refreshed now to reflect our evolution over the past decade um, and to better align with the key themes that are in the Oregon Transportation Plan. The second piece was around the roles of the commission and ODOT in, the, uh, in terms of the plan. So here on page five of the plan, we described the commission's role um, in terms of oversight um, with regards to the strategic plan, which is really about ensuring that ODOT is well managed and operating as efficiently and as possible and monitoring the progress and the results. The third area um, is around the governance and accountability priority, which was one, the, one of the four strategic priorities. Um, there were some concerns that were raised about the potential for confusion with the priority, which is about unifying and aligning our internal governance. So our intent with this priority is to enhance our internal operational governance, and I'll refer to that as the little g of governance. Um, Currently, we have a variety of operational governance structures in place within the organization. And if you'll recall, back to September, um, Pivotal conducted a baseline assessment and, and identified in there, we have a variety of management teams, leadership teams, um, and processes that do provide some effective um, governance at a more specific uh, local level, if you will, within the agency, so within business lines or divisions. So our goal with this priority is really to unify those across the agency in support of the purpose of the plan, which is really, again, to align the agency to a common set of priorities and goals um, that really enhance that organizational fitness. So that's different in intent from the management review recommendation that's regarding the clarification of ODOT and OTC governance, big G governance. So uh, that, that is what we will address this afternoon, um, further discussion in the workshop which will help address that work. And the outcomes of those discussions this afternoon will guide um, how our conversations take place around our internal operational governance. So I'll, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Chair Banning, for questions around that. 
So thank you. Um, and I alluded to this a little earlier. One of the challenges, language is important and um, guides us in terms of what we understand for process and um, the uh, on page 10 where we are calling out governance um, in terms of operational governance and then the over the oversight the governing body it, it just appeared to me that as the Transportation Commission uh, is a governing body for the for the agency I struggled with the utilization of the word governance within this document from an operational governance and then the governing body itself it just seemed convoluted but I might be an individual, um, one voice in that. I wanted to bring it to the commission in terms of, um, I understand where we're wanting to go from an internal, uh, this document is for the agency. Um, our fingerprints, as Director Garrett will say, are on this, but um, the governing of the agency is different from the OTCs, um, what our, um, work plan and, and business plan might be in terms of how we operate. So just the notation that we would need to define governance in the document led me to ask the question, is there another word that we want to use or are we comfortable with governance on both sides of this? And maybe it's not a distinction, but this afternoon we are going to be talking about the difference between management and governance and what it means to govern versus um, manage and provide leadership and, and oversight. So yeah. uh, maybe I'm hypersensitive to the two, but I wanted to bring this to you for a discussion point. Uh, Madam Please. Chair, I, I think you <laughs> tapped on the operative word, uh, which was oversight, and maybe that um, in, in how we govern and uh, might be a key part because the commission does have oversight over on, and it might just be a matter of we need to include that in the uh, dialogue here. Okay. Any other? <laughs> Commissioner Brown. Well, I think this, you mentioned this, uh, you know, a couple hours ago, and I didn't quite get the gist of where you were headed with it. Mm -hmm. I think if you look up the word governance um, and the director's role versus our role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think words do matter. Mm -hmm. We might want to change the word. I'm not sure I have a new word for you yet, um, but I think that oversight, it's, it's a little more than oversight from my perspective on what we're charged with doing. Uh, Director Garrett's internal management direction, is that governance? maybe that's the word that we change uh, and we really look for a, a better word mm -hmm. to look at the operational activities with leading an organization <coughs> maybe we look for that word um, but I think you're right I think governance means different things for, to different people and and words do matter so I just don't have an answer for you it's that's okay. why I, I was I was sort of going huh so I can look up governance and we can we can do some wordsmithing, but I think it's an important discussion to have because we've talked about roles and responsibilities, mm -hmm. uh, and I think we've got to land on something that we all understand the differentiation between Director Garrett's job in running the organization and our policy level governance and helping him shape how he does that. You know, what are the policy direction items. So I think that's where I see the differences a little bit. So good Thank good you. thing to bring up, but not sure I have a solution. Kelly's probably got it somewhere. Well, and we did uh, on our conference calls break out a thesaurus and a dictionary and really parsed through this mm -hmm. and struggled with what is the, uh, my inclination is as um, using it on both sides um, does not offer the clarity that I think that we need with where we are trying to get to. Um, but I don't have a definitive idea of what that other piece is. Um, this, of course, is phase one of this. It's not as though we cannot revisit it, but I wanted to just check in with the commission and see if you two were sharing some hesitation in terms of talking about our governance role and what it means to govern an agency and then from an operational perspective, what it means to govern within that agency. 
um, is that truly, are we best suited by using the same terminology? So please. Madam Chair, you could. I'm in trouble with this. Thank you. Um, you could use the word management or, or something. I mean, I would Google the word. I mean, I would look up mm -hmm. the word management, see if there are alternatives to that word. That, that seems to be a word we're using with respect to running the agency and operating the agency. So that might be the word, or there may be a better one. So, Would it make sense for us to um, finish this conversation this afternoon as we are mm -hmm. looking at this particular part of our role? Do you have apprehension about doing that? I, I don't, Chair Rainey. I think uh, we kind of, we were hoping that that workshop and that conversation was going to happen last month. So I think that right. would have brought, you know, that would have brought a different flavor to this conversation, I mm -hmm. think. Um, so, so I do think it makes sense to pause on that. And I agree that words mean a lot. We, we did talk about, as you recall, the word management, um, which does have different connotations. Yeah. It, it tends to go more towards the supervisory, you know, types of things. Um, but we're open to, you know, we want to make sure that it is clear and that we are not causing confusion between that policy level and the operational level governance. And if, if the word governance causes that much angst, then, we, you know, we would want to look at that. But I do think the conversation this afternoon may help inform okay. that clear, more clearly. Excellent. So, so let's table that piece. Okay. Other general comments and thoughts. And again, this is a uh, phase. So this is the bones, if we want to look at it that way, and offers an opportunity to really populate this with a bit more uh, detail and measurement mm -hmm. and uh, outcomes. So shall we go into that part? Sure. Okay. Um, so our next steps, for, uh, we really start moving right into the second phase of the work, which is around creating the success measures um, and defining what the specific actions are that are needed to implement the strategies. Um, so that work will take place over the next few months, um, and all of that will be added into this document um, to make this a complete plan. So this is phase one of the plan. That is, it's final in terms of the priorities, the strategies, the, the vision, um, and the refresh of the mission and values. Um, and then also during this time, we're going to be taking a time to pause and reflect on our existing or planned initiatives. Um, and those are really, we're talking about discretionary um, initiatives in relation to the priorities that we've identified in the plan. So this will provide us opportunity to look at whether we need to redirect resources um, from some things to others um, and making sure that we're focused and aligned in that unified direction we're seeking. Um, and then between now and July, we'll also be developing an implementation framework that will provide that cascading um, effect with the priorities throughout the organization. And we'll be executing a, a pretty thorough communication and change management strategy, um, both internally and externally. So a lot, a lot of work. I mean, we've done a lot of work, and now we've still got a lot more work ahead of us um, here to complete the plan. Um, and I want to just mention, too, that the conversation earlier around the workforce piece, I hope that you'll see that in the strategic plan that those are the same conversations um, that group has been having. So I think a lot of focus around the concerns that have been brought up will, will take place in, in that conversation. Wonderful. Okay, so questions, comments? Please. This right now is really essentially just an informational update which will kind of expand later on today, correct? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes and no. So we can refine this in our work session this mm -hmm. afternoon if you'd like. So what we could do is uh, table pieces. But if there are things that we that are beyond that, we would definitely want to let Ms. Bruce know so that because we do have to formally approve this because it is a uh, requirement phase. for the legislature. Yes. And this again is phase one. But the, the main question is if there are amendments that we deem necessary this isn't set in stone right now we still have the ability to amend or adjust since this is only phase one and there will be other phases sure before we, it's final you bet if we yeah. learn new different things we want to refine it as we go forward but we do need to approve something today and can be later but it doesn't mean that this document can't be adjusted when we get into phase two if that's your question Okay. So, Madam Chair, could Please. we approve it subject to amendments from this afternoon's work session? Absolutely. That would give us the flexibility to tweak if we mm -hmm. needed to. 
And again, if someone is interested in joining us, it is a public meeting. It's not as though we're crawling into a cave and hiding. We are <laughs> just, it allows us to be a little more informal and have discussion amongst ourselves and uh, in, in a public forum um, to set out our own work plan. Yeah. So, yes. I think, I think you said it perfectly. In that case, uh, Madam Chair, I move uh, that we approve the initial phase of ODOT's strategic business plan uh, and accept the management review impl implementation month monthly progress report subject to amendment from this afternoon's work session. Excellent. Further discussion or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion carries. For the management okay. uh, review implementation report, and I, I thank you for being so efficient, uh, Commissioner O'Halloran. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. So um, this afternoon, again, we will be addressing kind of that first recommendation from DAS around the governance um, clarification. Um, and then we also will be submitting to Department of Administrative Services and the Governor's Office our um, report on this strategic business plan to meet the, the deadlines around those. Um, next month, we are planning to bring forward the procurement conversation with you. Um, I believe that deadline is coming up, so they'll have um, material for you to review there. Everything else is on tap, on track. So, and I would, I would hope that we would not uh, amend the photo of uh, Ryan Winsheimer on page 16. All right, duly noted. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you. Great work. All right, next we'll move on to item G, also an action item. And this is a request for permission for the Office of Innovation to negotiate a public private partnership. And this is in reference to the conversion of highway lighting to LED. Hi. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Bainey. Commissioners, for the record, my name is Erica Dinsdale and I'm ODOT's Chief Innovation Officer. I'm joined today by Ted Miller, Region 1 Maintenance and Operations Ma excuse me, Manager, and Anne Hushagan. Hushagan. Okay, I'm working on it. I was hope. thank you. So, Hushagan? Hushagan. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. Close. I was wondering as well. I want to make sure that we could, yes. thank you. Hushagan from the okay. Oregon Department of Energy. Excellent, thank you. So today I'm here to ask for your approval to enroll the LED conversion project into the Oregon Innovative Partnership Program. As you know, the Oregon Innovative Partnership Program was created by the Oregon Legislature to develop partnerships with private entities in order to expedite project delivery, maximize innovation in project development, and leverage public funding with private sources of capital. ODOT has identified this program as a key innovative financing mechanism to deliver the conversion of highway lighting from low efficiency to high efficiency lighting in order to reduce energy and maintenance costs and increase safety by reducing staff time and work zones. Our partners to the north, Washington DOT, just completed a similar roadway pro lighting reform project where their private partner analyzed 2,500 lights, eliminated 600 fixtures, and converted the remaining 1,900 to LEDs. They estimated that over 15 years, this was a reduction of 7,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And they leveraged the financial expertise that the contractor brought to the table to really go after federal grants, energy rebates, and then they used the energy cost savings to pay for that project over 12 years with a 20-year life for the equipment. Our project here in Oregon represents an excellent opportunity for ODOT to improve our lighting infrastructure in the Portland metro region, while providing significant energy savings and helping meet the state's carbon reduction goals. If successful, we would expand this project to the rest of the state. In a moment, Ted is gonna share with you the benefits to his portfolio with this conversion, but first, from my standpoint, here's some process information. Energy performance contracts were enacted by the Oregon legislature as a way to finance large scale energy conservation projects and pay them back over time with actual energy savings. The program is administered by the Oregon Department of Energy, which pre-qualifies the firms based on their ability to deliver large-scale projects, technical expertise, financial solvency, those kinds of things. State agencies consider, or use it, considering using these performance contracts are actually required by law to select from the pre-qualified ODO list. But most of these projects 
uh, are vertical or building construction, which have some different elements to them. Um, often you know more about very specific energy usage. Um, for example, you would think about getting one bill for the building, right? Um, and the physical assets are uh, much more known, right? So you know where all the lights are in each room um, on, a, on a much easier basis. Um, the agency often contracts for or self-performs a lot of that early analysis work uh, and then works with the selected firm to do the installation. The addition of the Oregon Innovative Partnership Program allows ODOT to also contract with a firm to do this work as a turnkey project. The contractor would be responsible for the initial analysis, data, ga data gathering, verification, design, including identifying where fixtures can be eliminated, and then the, the installation, all while guaranteeing the state savings. ODOT simply does not have the resources available, especially in this time of large projects, uh, to be able to do this kind of early upfront work. Um, however, the need to be able to do this project from an energy savings, a um, greenhouse gas reduction, and especially the safety of our crews and the traveling public is still substantial. So using the Oregon Innovative Partnership Program will enable a ODOT to tailor the project from that horizontal environment uh, from the, excuse me, the vertical environment to the horizontal environment, which is what our highway lighting situation is, and focus on those critical issues that are unique to ODOT, such as safety, as well as informing and engaging the public. Although the exact scope, schedule, and budget are not known at this time, the Oregon Innovative Partnership Program process allows ODOT to investigate various options through negotiations with these pre-qualified firms, and identify optimal project parameters. Unlike traditional procurement methods, the OTC has more oversight into this process, and any agreements that are completed will ultimately come back here for your approval before we may begin implementation. As a practical matter, the next step if enrolled would be for ODOT to issue an RFP to all firms that are on ODO's pre-qualified list, and then move through a competitive selection process followed by negotiations with the successful firm, and then of course back to you for approval. Well, my office is responsible for the Oregon Innovative Partnership Program contracting mechanism itself, but it's Ted and his business that's driving the effort and the benefits that it has the potential to bring to his crews, to Region 1, and to the traveling public. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to him to talk a little bit about that. There you go. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me, Commissioners, Chair. Uh, Region 1 uh, has four counties, Washington, Clackamas, Hood River, and Multnomah. Within these counties, Region 1 maintains a little over 2,000 lane miles of highway. On these highways, there are several types of illumination systems. High-pressure sodium lighting is a primary source of lighting used on interstates, state, regional highways, traffic signals, multi-use path, bridges, and tunnels that would benefit from LED upgrades. Of over 10,000 illumination heads in inventory in Region 1, only about 200 have been updated to LED due to budgets and existing resources. Benefits of LED lighting include visits to repair and replace are less, reducing worker exposure to high traffic volumes in work zones, increasing overall safety of our maintenance workers and crews. Less frequent work zones mean impacts to the traveling public and mobility are reduced and safety increases. Reduced cost of maintenance, LED has a longer lifespan. Less visits to relamp improves overall light quality for the traveling public. The current replacement of high pressure sodium lighting is one to three years, which means more impact to the highways and more impact to our workers out on the highway. Compared to LED lighting, 10 to 20 year replacement cycles are much longer uh, and those highway closures or lane closures that impact the traveling public are much less. Reduce cost of operations by lowering utility bills for ODOT as well as agency partners that we currently have intergovernmental agreements with. Overall transportation maintenance costs go down. 
In preparation for LED upgrades, Region 1 managers and crew personnel have updated inventory data, prepared as-built information, and have prioritized upgrades on conditions. So with that, I think we'll open it up for questions and discussion and, and uh, ultimately looking for your approval today if, if you so, so wish. And we have Anne here also to answer any questions about the Department of Energy's program as well. Wonderful. Commissioner Simpson and then Commissioner Van Brocklin. Yeah, thank you. Um, obviously, I'm very intrigued and inspired by this project. It's very exciting to see that we're taking steps in the direction of sustainability that keeps our uh, carbon footprint down and starts preparing to lay the groundwork for the future. Um, I was curious about um, what is the what is going to be the process next as we move into, I guess, your, we soliciting proposals, I guess, development of the RFP, the content that goes in that, the point structure. When is that supposed to be completed? Commissioner Simpson, great question. Uh, in anticipation of making sure we're ready to move as fast as we can so we can take advantage of the benefits that are really important to Region 1, we already have an RFP drafted that we did in consultation with the Department of Energy folks who know how to do that about the performance contracting. Um, and so they have that ready to go uh, so that we could be able to release that to all the firms on the list um, after your all's decision. Okay, because um, I, uh, I have encountered some concerns related to um, uh, outreach for smaller firms as it relates to um, clean energy types of projects and programs and certifications. and. I'm wondering if that's going to be an element of this RFP in terms of its point um, scale uh, as it relates to social impacts or community benefits and uh, subcontracting opportunities, given the fact that what's been indicated in here is that um, we can even, there are even provisions entering in direct negotiations with private firms in certain circumstances. So that kind of, you know, that kind of gets me curious about how we're going to proceed um, in terms of um, our outcomes of this overall. I understand there is an environmental benefit here, but I think as sure. a holistic project, as it relates to sustainable outputs, we should be looking at it all encompassing. And adding some of these outputs as part of our overall agenda related to our own sustainability plans and um, equity goals as an agency. So um, I'm going to be very interested in understanding how we go about the selection process and the firms that are proposing and what their backgrounds are as it relates to working with subcontractors and smaller um, certified firms specifically. Thanks. Great, thank you. Is there anything you want to say about Does that the firms do, on the list? Because I think it is important to underscore as we look at a qualified pool, what does our qualified pool look like that we would be negotiating with? Have we already made the decision that we're jumping over this important point? Um, when we pre-qualify firms, uh, we, I mean, there's a, a portion of that where they are, are have to follow all of the contracting rules and, and um, submit to, I, I don't remember, I'm not a contracting expert, I'm a mm -hmm. technical person more but that they have to use the same state procurement mm -hmm. uh, rules for minority businesses and women-owned businesses and so on, whatever that right. term so, is called. So, so. commissioners, the, um, the pre-qualified list that we will need to be able to send the RFP to, we're required by law to use that list, so we can't obviously go and find additional folks to add to that. And really the work that we're talking about here is highly technical, it requires a large degree of financial solvency. And so what that often means is that the firms, were, the primary firms, the con prime contracting firms that we're talking about, um, are fairly large in nature to be able to guarantee over a life of whatever it ends up being, 10 or 12 years, that these contracts can perform to the level that they're entering into that agreement today. That being said, um, if I'm hearing you correctly, Commissioner Simpson, I'm hearing a desire to also look at how we um, uh, phrase the RFP as much as is allowable according to our laws uh, to encourage um, their use of subcontractors that meet a lot of our other goals that we have. Is that 
it's kind of. <clears throat> uh, first thing is um, uh, the the intent of my question was not suggesting that this particular RFP go to a smaller firm that doesn't have an unsurmountable level of qualifications and financial capacity, even though we would never want to say that we would assume that anybody doesn't anyway, because right. I think that's the wrong way to, <laughs> to explain that. However, uh, my, my suggestion is more over, I would be interested if we're going to go in an RFP process for something as, of this nature that's a pilot project that we're mm -hmm. looking at rolling out to the rest of the state, that we look to um, installing content in that RFP that suggests that these entities are going to be proposing or reaching out um, intentionally to smaller contractors in an effort to partner or to provide right. opportunities. And I think that as part of our point structure, that should be something that's very um, heavily focused on, just because I think it's just part right. of it's the right thing to do. Great. So what I can do is I will take that back to the team, and we will look through that RFP with a fine-tooth comb, and we're happy to um, have a phone call with you to review that in more detail if you'd like, or or follow follow up with that, or to the whole commission as you would as you would like. We'll probably move faster than. Um, your next commission meeting, um, but we'd want to make sure that as much as we're able, we're, we're incorporating all of those things. So one point, it's only required by law that we use the qualified pool if we are using this process. Isn't that correct? If we did a different process, we are not required by law to use that specific pool. If we're using the energy performance contracts, then yes, which is the mechanism that allows the utility costs, the savings and utility costs to pay for the installation. Okay. So, so Ma that, Madam Chair, yes. I, think, I think on energy savings performance contracts are, are, are a great thing because the, the, the capital cost is borne by the private sector contractor who is executing the contract um, and they pay themselves back um, based on their calculation and, and surety uh, that there's cost savings from an energy standpoint mm -hmm. and whatnot. So I see to uh, Commissioner Simpson's point, but if this, uh, and, and the payback period is based on the number of years that they calculate, if they're only getting a small amount of savings, it's gonna be a longer payback, bigger savings, but um, they can pay themselves back more quickly in a shorter timeline. Um, however, I think to Erica's point, the long-term financial solvency um, and the risk factor of this puts it into big players, mm -hmm. um, big, highly capitalized uh, companies that uh, can carry this on their book from a positive standpoint. So, I, I mean, I understand the, the, the desire here, but I think the pool of applicants, and I, and I think that one of the things we ought to look at down the road is doing energy performance contracting throughout the department. We have a lot of buildings. <laughs> um, I'm sure we could do a lot of savings, and that and and so I think it would probably open it up for opportunity for much smaller uh, players to enter the the foray here. So, but I, I mean, I understand kind of the dynamic of how this works, and that you have to have highly capitalized. Uh, entities that will be viable players if they're we want to have confidence that they're going to be around 10 years from now and that they're going to be able to bear the risk so that it doesn't fall back on us I think that's the intent if that's helpful at all thank you commissioner so I mean I would just uh, adopt the comments that uh, have just been made by Commissioner Simpson and you know, Holleran, uh, the comment I wanted to make, really more of a comment than a question, was I, I wanted to congratulate you for bringing this forward. I think it's an important step. I hope it's successful at the pilot project level and can go statewide. Um, it, it's important that we look at all facets of our operations and try to drive down our carbon footprint significantly. I think this, the, all agencies of state government should be doing this. I think we should be moving toward trying to be a state which is maybe the first state in the country that's carb carbon neutral. And uh, I think it's incumbent upon us as a commission to be pushing that element of, uh, of the work that's being done here forward. 
so I, again, congratulate you on bringing this forward. I would like to uh, have us as a commission reserve some time at some point in future meeting to hear about other things you're exploring sure. uh, and, um, and take um, seriously our own goal of, of sustainability and trying to, to be an agency and an operation that is uh, looking for ways to um, push the envelope on this. So um, I, I'm prepared to vote yes. Right. So I share Commissioner Van Brocklin's comments as well. I think when we get a bit more of the performa and what we're thinking in terms of savings and just give us a bit more of the what we project to be um, our successes and so that we have an opportunity to know um, you know, if it's working and, um, you know, really what we anticipate to see on that side. Uh, but in, if there are no other comments or uh, questions, I would certainly welcome a motion. So I, I would move uh, that the Oregon Transportation Commission authorize ODOT's Office of Innovation to negotiate a public-private partnership to increase energy efficiency through conversion of highway lighting to, to LED lighting. Great. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Okay, so we will now take a break for lunch and we'll be back here at 1240.